Okay, three, two, one. Hello, world! I hope you spent a beautiful weekend. I did. Um, we've got some PSA today, as always. So let's go to the coding scene. So I'm able to show you the screen. Today is the 5th of December 2020, and it's 9 o'clock UTC, which means 10 o'clock in Italy. And uh, I don't know which other time zone you are. Uh, I, I know that some viewers are from Germany, some from Spain, some from Indonesia. And I happened to meet even um, one guy from Germany and one from Colombia last Wednesday, because I started doing a mix of lessons on Saturday and just chilling and uh, playing music uh, during Wednesdays. So since on Wednesdays, on Wednesdays I do the stream in the late afternoon, uh, finally I'm able to reach uh, some people from the American continent, at least for just uh, some music and, uh, and some chatting. And that's fine, that's fine. Um, so, today we are supposed to do some intermediate CSS. But first, as always, uh, we didn't finish the CSS base. Uh, so we're going to, 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 to cover all the topics that are in CSS base. And um, I think that this will be a very strange particular lesson because we are going to showcase everything that CSS provides and I will run through every single feature of CSS that I could find. Maybe there are even lots more, but I will focus on the main ones. And I will stress a little more and I will do a little bit of uh, coding and exercise only on the most crucial and difficult features to use. Because as you probably already saw, CSS is pretty basic. Uh, well, the rules are pretty basic. You have to just create a, a rule like a selector, some property name, some property value, and that's it. That's the only thing that you need to know about the CSS syntax in general. But still, we've got uh, some other uh, syntax rules that we have to know. And based on those rules, you just need to know the names of the things that you want to achieve and you will achieve them just by googling them. So it's pretty pretty easy, pretty basic, pretty normal. Let me see if everything is in place. You can hear my voice. The streaming and the recording is on is in place. I see currently three viewers watching. Um, which could be more because the the phone doesn't tell me exactly the right number sometimes. And uh, I hope that you are with me. <laughs> I don't see anybody um, greeting or speaking in the chat or writing in the chat, but that's fine, that's fine. Uh, it's still Saturday morning, at least for some of you, uh, and also for me. So, first of all, I would love to really, really... Oh, yes, we've got two people that I know and that I was about to speak about, Tiago and Sao. Tiago and Sao did their homework and care to share their homework in uh, the school's channel of our Slack application, and I loved their work. Uh, I, I couldn't stop looking at what, they, at what they did. With the few things that I told them, they already achieved a very important result. So, Tiago created a website which is well, a curriculum, a CV, in fact, you can see it from the title on the tab. Tiago Machado lives in Porto, he's very optimistic, proactive, etc. I don't want to run through all the data. You can find uh, Tiago if you look at this URL or if you join us in Slack. And uh, he's an engineer, he's a chemical engineer. Kudos, <laughs> you're a colleague, but I'm a software engineer, so different kind of engineer. Um, and he created this uh, multi-page website with uh, backlinks, which are really, really important from a user experience perspective, because sometimes you can, um, you can browse this web page on a device that doesn't have a clear back button, for example, on some iPhones. So it's really, really good to have this multi-page um, websites with the backlink. And I love this kind of, uh, of layout. And um, how did you do that? Well, you created a table. 
That's awesome. You created a tab. This is tabular data. So it's a good thing to use a table in order to show tabular data. That's awesome. And uh, what else do we have? Skills acquired. Okay, so these are lists. But these lists have a specific style. This list is of type square. And I love squares uh, as bullets in lists. Also, Tiago added some icons and uh, he just downloaded some PNG or created them by himself and he just put them um, next, to the, next to the text, which is really, really cool. So, so many things that you achieved creatively and there's also the contents page in which I think Tiago experimented a little bit with the different kinds of links. So, this is his phone and if you see the, uh, the, the writing here on the bottom left of the browser, you can see that this is a special link. This is a tell link which allows the user to, when, he clicks, when the user clicks on the link, it allows the user to just phone Tiago directly. And the same goes with the email link. If I click on the email link, it will probably open my email client and allow me to write an email to Tiago. And then there's a website, which is the LinkedIn page. And I also asked him to add GitHub. And both websites, since they are not internal links and they go to some other um, domain, they open on a new tab, which is probably better than opening in the same tab. Yes, I do accept cookies. Here's Tiago's page, master degree in chemical engineering. And the same goes with GitHub, in which I see that Tiago is properly using Git. In fact, he's writing lots of code, he's following along, and he's committing and pushing everything. So this is very, very good commitment. I really appreciate your efforts here. And it's awesome. You, we are at the eighth lesson and you're still with me and you're, you're, you're going really, really good. This is more than I expected. So awesome website, Tiago. And you will see, you will make it even better with some, uh, with some CSS. I, I can't wait to see what you're able to do. And the same goes with Sao. Sao created a beautiful website, which is a little minimalistic in the sense that it doesn't show, her, uh, show m much about her, but it shows a lot about her passions and her stuff. So this is the page about her stuff. Um, and this is a page with internal links. So, so she tried to experiment with this other feature that I, that I explained, which is about jumping to different sections of the web page. This is awesome. This is a, a beautiful way to, uh, to, to, to experiment with, the, with this notion that I gave you. This is really, really good. And we also have uh, some, um, some italic text here. Uh, which looks like a quote. That's awesome. And, and oh, it's in, in a pre tag. That's, that's also cool. So you use the pre formatted um, tag to show this text in a mono spaced font. This is really, really cool. And, um, and also, you too uh, added backlinks. So perfect navigation, perfect user experience here. And then in the quotes section, uh, there's just a link of uh, quotes by someone. So we've got these quotes here. Uh, they're not linked as the other page, but that's fine because they're just three. So you don't need to uh, create internal links this, in this case, probably. And here I see that you experimented a little more with the mail tag. In fact, if I click on this tag, it shows me a little more. It uh, pre-compiles the uh, to section, but also the subject and even the body of the email. How did Sao achieve this? Oops, sorry, it's not what I intended. Okay, so apparently you can create a mail to kind of link in which you say, let's see if we can see it a little larger, mail to to the address and then you add some parameters to this address. So you put a question mark to separate the address from the parameters. You remember the parameters of a form? This is exactly the same thing. So you have subject equal hello with exclamation mark and to separate one parameter from the other, body equals to hi, can we talk about something? So apparently you can add custom parameters such as subject and body in order to customize the message better. 
and this is really cool. This is something that I, I haven't explained in my lessons and you, Sao, came up with it by yourself. You found this information by yourself, which is awesome. This is what I, what I really uh, love about the creativity of this job and how you achieved to, to have this creativity and to apply your creativity to this, uh, to this kind of, of, of task, okay? So, let's go back to CSS base. And I already told what is CSS, what's the purpose of CSS, but you probably already know this already. Um, including CSS, we found four different ways of including CSS. Let's just wrap them up. We can import a CSS as a link inside of an HTML page, which is probably the preferred way, because um, this way we can write the CSS in a completely separate file, which is the style CSS, for example, and we can reuse this file across multiple web pages. Uh, every web page that wants to apply the rules of style CSS just needs to add this link in the head of the document and the rules will apply to that page. So we've got style CSS applied here. I don't remember if about, yeah, also about applies the same style. Uh, another way to apply rules is to import rules inside of other CSS. So for example, here we use the at import rule, which allows to combine different style sheets together. So we can have a main style sheet with sub style sheet, uh, e each one of them uh, pertaining some particular meta. For example, we can have a piece of style sheet, uh, a file itself that deals with fonts, one that deals with colors, ones that one that deals with uh, how buttons behave or something like that. And you can import all these styles together in a main style sheet and you can combine them all together. Or maybe uh, style sheets that uh, pertain responsiveness. So uh, a style sheet for mobile, a style sheet for printers, a style sheet for screen recorders, screen readers, not screen recorders, screen readers, etc, etc. So you can combine style sheets together with this at import rule. Uh, another way is to write the style sheet inside of the HTML with this style tag, which is something that I don't really recommend because this style, of course, will have effect only on this document and you cannot reuse the styles elsewhere but there could be some cases in which this could be convenient. For example, I could use this way today during my lessons because I want to explore different things in different documents. So as soon as we see, for example, the CSS grid, I can write my styles in the same document in which I'm experimenting CSS grid. Instead of uh, creating a different file and importing it here, we have everything in the same place. So from... Um, teaching point of view, it could be convenient for me to use this, uh, this style of styling, this, uh, this, this way of including style sheets in your page. But in general, I would say don't do this unless you really know what you're doing and just use separate CSS files because they separate better concerns. The concerns of HTML, which is about defining the structure of your document and the concern of presenting this document in a nice and accessible way, which is a concern of CSS. The last way, the fourth way that we can add style to our documents is with the style attribute that practically every tag, every visible tag has. So you can define styles separated by a semicolon and this works and this will even have higher priority than other styling techniques, but it's really, really ugly and makes the uh, document really, really difficult to read and to maintain because you are mixing together structure, content and also styling. So the, the document, well, th this is a really easy and simple document, but as soon as the document becomes more complex, having all these styles there will make the document really, really difficult to, to read and maintain. So this is probably the worst way of all and should be avoided as much as possible. So we already saw a few basic properties about text, color and spacing, and we can rehearse them really, really quickly. I had go live. Um, I was asked to go a little 
quicker on this part because this is really really easy stuff so if uh, everybody agrees I will actually go pretty quickly I don't even know if I will give you the time to uh, write the code along with me especially during the showcase part in which I will show you uh, this is a rule that makes this and you can use it like that okay let's let's go to the next rule so um, don't worry uh, if I'm going really, really fast. You can just watch for now uh, or you, you can try, of course, if you are fast enough. And uh, as soon as we find something that is a little more, you know, deep and needs a little more time, then I will slow down in that case. But if we do like this, there's a chance that we can finish CSS today or maybe during half of the next lesson and we can start with the real thing which is JavaScript and in that moment we will we will have a completely different kind of lesson in which we'll go really slow you have to code along with me uh, you cannot escape from that but for now it's just a more of a showcase of what CSS is able to do so about we said about text so about text, we've got some rules that pertain text. For example, um, in this hello world, we saw that we can have something like text, um, sorry, font family. Font family allows me to, um, to change the font of this text, which can be monospace. You see, hello world is monospaced or it can be Arial, a sans serif font, or it can be Times New Roman, which is a serif font, or you can even say, let's make it Times New Roman, and if you cannot find Times New Roman on the page, then you will use Arial. So I will just put a comma uh, between Times New Roman and Arial, which means that if Times New Roman is available, definitely use that. But if it's not available on the browser or on the system, then fall back to Arial. And if Arial is not available, you can fall back to something else, for example, Monospace. Uh, usually these fonts are always available in every browser. And this has uh, more meaning as soon as you, uh, you define some uh, other, other fonts that are not uh, existing um, in every browser. For example, the, the font called Roboto, maybe not every browser, browser has it. In fact, my brother, browser doesn't have it, apparently. Uh, what about Ubuntu? Uh, let's put it next to Roboto. Ubuntu. Oh, okay. I'm gonna write it correctly. Okay, apparently I have a font called Ubuntu because the text changed. So, um, the browser didn't find Roboto and it fell back to Ubuntu. If it didn't find Ubuntu, then it would have fallen back to Times New Roman, etc, etc, etc. But I do have Ubuntu because I'm running Ubuntu on my machine. So it's pretty uh, normal that I have a font called Ubuntu. And this is the font called Ubuntu, which is a free and open source font. Um, I don't know if you've got Ubuntu font on your Mac or your PC, Windows PC, uh, but still you can install new fonts and I will show you how in a while. So we've got font family. Uh, let's see what other rules are suggested here in, the, in Ryan's tutorials, I don't remember. Um, blah blah blah, font family, oh there's also Verdana, I always forget Verdana and oh font size, okay so as for the font size I can say font size is I don't know 32 pixels which is a lot, hello world becomes really huge why, why am I writing everything in here and what does it mean to write everything in here? Let's rehearse this. I already mentioned it last, uh, during the last lesson. But uh, if you write rules in here, those rules are completely temporary. In fact, if I refresh the browser, I will lose all these rules. And as you can see, the selector in this rule is pretty strange. It's element.style. It's not a real selector. It just tells me that these rules will only apply to the element that I have selected. In fact, this results in the HTML part of this developer tools in an inline style, which is something that I already told you I don't like. We shouldn't do this. Uh, but since we're doing things temporarily, yeah, we can accept this. If you don't accept this, however, we can make this uh, all these changes permanent and uh, better looking by 
by writing them into a CSS style sheet that is already included in the index. So this is the index page, right? Index page has a link to style and has a link to theme. So I'm going to open style and here I can write every P should have a font family of uh, Ubuntu. And if you don't find Ubuntu, let's call Verdana. And if you don't have Verdana, let's put Arial, for example. And we can have, uh, how did I say that, font size? Yeah, and I put a font size of 32 pixels, for example, okay? So, um, this is still the element style uh, applied as we said before, but if I refresh the page, then I will see that all the styles that I had are completely uh, over. And now I see this new rule, P with font family, Ubuntu, Verdana, Arial, font size 32 pixels. And I can, of course, as always, switch on and off the different rules in order to see what changes in my page, okay? I've got some notifications from, from some of my former students. Uh, I will reply later. Okay. So this is how you change font size and font family, but there's also font weight. And we already told something about font weight. So we can have font weight of um, normal, which is what a, a paragraph usually has. So font weight of normal didn't change anything at all, but I can, yeah, I can say font weight bold and you will see that the font becomes bolder. So this is the right alternative to using the B tag or the strong tag even. Um, or you can use the strong tag, but by making it bolder. So whenever you want to have something bold, for example, hello world, uh, CSS is great. How do you put great in bold? So there are multiple alternatives. One alternative is to use the B tag. But as I already mentioned, I don't like the B tag because bold is a property that should be inside of a style sheet. It should not be part of the structure of the document. So it should not be part of HTML. I'm gonna, um, okay, this was still with font weight or normal. So you see, hello world, CSS is great. And this is bold. This is fine, but still, we don't like the B tag because the HTML shouldn't tell me what is bold, what is blue, what is italic. Should just give me the importance of this word, of this word. So, for example, you can say strong. You are with the with this uh, tag. You are saying that great, great should be seen as a strong word, but not necessarily bold. And yes, by default, strong has a font weight of, uh, well, apparently normalized told me that the font weight should be bolder even. But I can just say, if, if I remove this, um, this rule, you will see that by default, the browser tells me that the font weight of a strong element is bold. So this is already done. But I can go to my style sheet and I can say that strong for me doesn't mean it should be bold. Uh, it should be normal. And, uh, you know, it should have a different font family instead. It should have a monospace. Okay, so I'm, I'm overriding the default, um, the default browser settings by saying, okay, this is another former student of mine. Uh, every Saturday morning, I, I have to tell my my friends and students that I have this, the lessons, they never, they never remember this. Uh, so I'm saying that a strong, this was the, the guy that uh, suffered from COVID, but now he's, he's okay, luckily. Returned back to my house yesterday. Okay, he's fine, that's, that's awesome. Uh, I will reach back to him during the coffee break, but not now. So, I was saying that um, the strong tag is usually rendered as bold, but I can say I don't want it to be bold, I want it to be normal, and I want its family to be monospace, so I want a different font family. And this is what I have. So I'm overriding the font weight provided by, uh, this was normalizer, 
and this was the user agent style sheet, so the default settings of the browser. And I am also saying that the font family should be monospace this, in, this time. So as you can see, the document says that this text is strong, but in CSS, I define what it means to be, to me, st strong, what, what strong should look like. And this is how you decouple these two concerns. Which, so uh, I, I'm gonna tell him, uh, sorry, bro, I'm doing lesson on Twitch. BRB. Okay. <laughs> So, um, okay, you, you got this, I, I suppose. The strong is just a tag, or you can even do something different, and I'll tell you in a while, not immediately. Okay, color properties. I already told you that you can use the color property, and you can put different kinds of values for the color. So this is a hexadecimal number, and the cool thing is that you don't need to speak hexadecimal in order to find colors. In fact, as one of you told me already, uh, you are able to go to Adobe Colors, for example, or any website that uh, allows you to cherry pick a good color. You can do this even from the uh, Visual Studio Code editor. You can pick a color such as this one here, and this is the hexadecimal number related to this color. So. Don't need to speak hexadecimal, just choose visually the color and then you copy paste the corresponding code, color code. Uh, there's also other kinds of uh, colors that you can create, for example, the RGB or RGBA. RGB stands for red, green, blue, and A stands for alpha. So you can have a color, but with transparency too, because alpha is about transparency. Or you can use hue set, hue, Oh my god, hue saturation value and also hue saturation value alpha in order to add transparency. Uh, there are different ways to, to, to name those colors. Angelo says, but then what is the recommended way of highlighting single words in CSS? Do I have to give them some ID that I can refer to in the CSS file? That's a good question. Yes, the ID is a good idea. The class is another good idea and I'm going to tell you in a while. Or, yeah, in this case, you can use strong. If you, it depends on, um, on how you want to uh, set up your document. So if, you want, if, if your document have lots of strong words that you want to highlight, then you can use the strong tag. That's fine. Or you can use a special span in which you add an ID or a class. But I haven't uh, told anything about IDs and classes so far, so I'm going to stick with this and then I'm going to tell you about IDs and classes. But you're free. CSS gives you a lot of freedom. In fact, there's so many ways to, to create ugly documents, uh, ugly, ugly CSS and, uh, and HTML documents, and there's a few ways to write beautiful documents. And this is where you can shine, actually, because if you like this kind of... Uh, I don't want to say it's programming, but it is programming. If you like uh, programming HTML and CSS, well, you can become a master in HTML and CSS. And when I say a master, I'm saying, for example, that there are people who are creating paintings and art in CSS. I don't know if you know about this, but recently there's people that created things like, let's see if it loads. I think it will be pretty... Yeah, it's pretty heavy because there are so many CSS rules that are being applied. Uh, let's, jo let's just go to see pictures, maybe. Uh, so, for example, one of the first CSS paintings that we saw is this thing here. This is a painting that is purely made in CSS through the creation of uh, tags that were styled in a special way and this doesn't look like an HTML document, but it is, okay? So I don't know if Mona Lisa is able to load, probably not. That was unfortunate. But still, we can do so many things in CSS, beautiful from uh, the point of view of uh, the visible part, but also beautiful from the point of view of how we structure our code, um, how we engineer our code, okay? 
So, okay, colors. We, we also have background color. If you want to add a background to your, uh, your, your piece of HTML, you can add a background to the body, which is what we did here. We used background, which is a shortcut, and I'll tell you what this is. But you can say background color, and it's the same thing. But you can also add a background color to a specific tag. For example, let's put a background color to this tag. Um, and I'm going to say, I don't know, aqua, okay? I'm a Barbie girl. And as you can see, the background color is applied only to the P, to the paragraph, including the text, of, uh, the text, of course. Um, there's also these two, uh, seems like borders on top and below, but these are not borders, these are margins. In fact, you can see it here uh, in this box model that this paragraph is wide 174 dot blah 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 pixels and is high uh, 111 pixels, but it has a margin on top which is 32 pixel, and a margin on the bottom, which is 32 pixels. And as you can see, those two margins are not colored in aqua. So the margin is not part of the bounds of this paragraph, okay? And we are going to talk a little more about bounds and margins. So, let's go, okay. As you can see, this guy uh, set a green background color to the H1 and a bluish background color to the P. So we've got this. We've got the H1 with a background of green and two paragraphs that are colored in blue. But they are, as you can see, they are separate because they have some margin in between. Okay, spacing properties, and this is where uh, we stopped last time. So we have multiple options for spacing. In fact, let me go back here. I already told you that the background is not applied to the margin, but I want to have a little bit of spacing between the, 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 well, the, the bounds of the rectangle and the text. And that's where the padding comes into place. I can use padding 10 pixels, and you will see that I will have some spacing, but inside of this rectangle, inside of the bounds of this paragraph. And now the text, Hello World CSS is great, in fact, has some space and it's not um, attached to the borders. And as you can see in the box model here, the padding is another property that we have here. So we've got the, the bounds of the, of the paragraph, but we also have the padding. We also have a border that we haven't covered yet. And finally, we have a margin, which is external to the bounding box of this, uh, of this paragraph, okay? Uh, the padding, as you can see, is applied in all four directions, on the top, on the right, on the bottom, and on the left. And this is achieved by using the padding word, which is actually a shorthand property that allows you to write in one sentence four different properties. And these are the four different properties. You can define padding top, padding right, padding bottom, and padding left. And these four properties allow you to trigger the padding where you want. For example, let's switch off this padding, and I can say padding top should be 10 pixels, but padding left should be 20 pixels. And as you can see, I only have padding on the top and on the left, and the padding on the left is twice the amount of, as the padding on the top, but we don't have any padding on the right and on the bottom. So if you want the same padding for all corners or um, all cardinal points, you can use padding. If you want to have a specific padding for the top, the left, the right or the bottom, you can use these properties, the specific properties, padding top, padding left. You can also combine them all. For example, if I write padding 10 pixels, padding left 20 pixels, you are saying that the padding should be 10 pixels in the four different points, but you are overriding the property of left by saying that, no, but the left should be 20 pixels. In fact, this is what you have, what you see here when you expand the shorthand property. The padding is 10 pixels all over, but the padding left was overridden by this other property that I specified immediately after, okay? So, this is what you have here. Uh, you see that the padding is equal on all sides, but you have a padding on the left, which is double the amount. Padding is also 
um, you can write a padding in uh, another different way, which is also convenient. So padding al allows you to specify one number, so padding 10 pixels, or you can specify two numbers, which is another shorthand property that tells that the padding should be 10 pixels on top and bottom and 20 pixels on left and right. So if you have this kind of symmetry, you can write padding this way and not having four different uh, padding specifications. As you can see, padding top and padding bottom will be 10 pixels, but padding right and padding left should be, uh, will be 20 pixels. Or in the same place, you can specify four different numbers, such as five pixels and, uh, I don't know, 30 pixels. And this is specifying the padding clockwise. So it starts from the top, if I remember correctly. So the top will be 10 pixels. Then we'll have a padding of 20 pixels on the right, then five pixels on the bottom and 30 pixels on the left. If you're not sure, if you don't remember which one is which, don't worry because the browser will tell you. In fact, it's uh, confirming my suspicion that yes, it goes uh, clockwise starting from the top. So top is 10, right is 20, uh, bottom is 5, and left is 30. But if you don't remember it, just remember there's Google, who's your friend? So you can say CSS padding on Google, you will find probably the first link which is always W3Schools, and you have all the information you need. Padding can be specified as four different kinds of paddings, padding top, right, bottom, left, or with a shorthand property, padding, which allows you to specify the four properties at once, or even three properties, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you this, even three properties, which means that the top padding is the first property, right and left are specified by the second property, and bottom padding is the third property. Or you can have two values, which allows you to say, well, the vertical and the horizontal padding, or even just one number, which tells you the padding all over the bounding box. So as you can see, uh, I, I didn't even know everything about this, or I didn't even remember all that I can do, but no worries, because there's always free resources online that I could just uh, look at and uh, learn new stuff every time, every single time. You know what? For me, teaching is always a very important learning occasion. Craze Honey! Hey! Hi, Craze Honey! Um, do I know you? No, probably not. Welcome to this stream. Welcome to the eighth lesson about programming in HTML, CSS, and in the near future, also JavaScript. So this is what padding is about. Nope, just followed. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. So funny when teachers in school used to say that later in life you cannot just Google stuff. <laughs> no, that's completely oh shit. Especially, especially in programming. There's lots of memes about this. Uh, there's yeah, there's uh, teachers that say you cannot just uh, build a life uh, by googling stuff, and then you find yourself, especially in programming, is you're always googling stuff. And are you learning or teaching both? I'm b both, actually. I have a teaching experience of many years now, but I'm still learning how to teach. And sometimes I learn uh, some, even some new concepts whenever I teach. Because when you, when, you, uh, when you work in a workplace environment, you must know exactly the right amount of information needed to accomplish the task. But when you're teaching, you want to go a little deeper in the detail of things and you have to uh, well answer to the question of your, to the questions of your students so i learn a lot as, when i'm teaching and uh, teaching is actually my uh, pr favorite way of learning stuff so uh, i was talking about padding i hope that you understood padding there's also this other property about spacing, which is margin, and it's another really, really important property. So I can add margin, and it goes exactly like the padding. In fact, I can type four different values, or I can say margin top, margin bottom, margin left, margin right, or I can say just margin, uh, I don't know, 30 pixels, which I think it's way too much. If uh, my margin is way too much, you will see that the text uh, is starting to overflow in, uh, in special occasions. And where's this margin? Well, if I hover on the paragraph, you will see the margin is in uh, orange 
or outside of the bounding box of this paragraph, right? Crazy, ha Crazy Hanny says, I'm trying to learn HTML and CSS, so the things you're doing are a bit more advanced than what I'm doing, but I'll stick around because I'll probably learn a thing or two. Awesome. Um, thank you for sticking with us. And if, if this is already too advanced for you, I really encourage you to go to the YouTube channel of Inglorious Coders, where I'm uploading all the lessons that we made so far. Uh, so we started with the command line interface and then we went uh, to Git, a source control um, tool that we are using to upload our code on the internet, uh, Netlify, etc, etc. And then we started with HTML and CSS. So if you want to catch up, you can go watch the videos there. And you can also stick around with, uh, with us, with me. There's also a Slack channel that you can join. Uh, just tell me if you need to and uh, I can send you the invitation to the Slack channel or you can just send me your email address. So there's lots of ways you can catch up and it's good that you are here today because if you were here, I don't know, uh, the, in the following two lessons, you would probably not be able to catch up. So you're right on time, I think. So as for margins, uh, I added a margin of 30 pixels. And this margin seems like padding, but as you can see, the margin is not affected by the background color. So this is the margin outside of the element, not inside of the element. And also, it has a special property that padding doesn't have. In fact, you can add a margin... Uh, let's me... Okay. Uh, you can add a negative margin. So what happens if I say margin left is 50 pixels? you see that the paragraph shifted even outside of the document. You cannot see it all, right? So this is a peculiar property uh, about margins, which can be used at your advantage. And I will show you one special case in which I used it at my advantage. And it's in, on this website. So you see this, um, uh, th this picture here. And you see that this picture is slightly outside of the background. How did I make it overlap between these two uh, sections, the background one and the white one one? And the white one one and the white one. So how did I do this? With margin, with negative margin. In fact, as you can see here, the right portion of this hero section has a margin bottom of negative five REMs. Uh, I didn't tell you what REM is, uh, stick with me. But if I remove this margin bottom, you will see that it's inside of the background. But if I put the margin bottom, then I'm placing this thing a little, you know, outside of where it should be. So a negative margin is always really, really cool. Uh, a really, really cool way to place things outside of where they should be. And there's also another thing that I have to tell you, which is this. Let me see if I can show you. Um, I don't think I can show it with a P. Let's put a div. And uh, so we've got a div that contains hello world CSS is great. And I want this div in particular to be to have a, a fixed width. For example, 300 pixels is uh, sufficient probably. Nope. Um, 200 pixels. Okay, as you can see, 200 pixels means that this div does not span the whole width of the document. In fact, it's uh, 200 pixels wide, but then there's some uh, right margin that is automatically added uh, on the right, the, the orange part, right? So what if I want this div to be horizontally centered inside of the page. Well, there's a common recipe that uh, usually web developers know, which is this. Margin is zero space auto. What is this? Well, margin zero auto, as you can tell, uh, the first property is the vertical margin. So I'm just saying that the margin top and the margin bottom are zero. They were zero before because I didn't have any margin and now I still have zero. And auto allows you to add equal amounts of margin on the left and on the right so the div is spaced. So if you want horizontally spaced divs, which 
have a specific size, you can center them with this uh, particular recipe. You specify a fixed width somehow, or maybe those divs already have a fixed width. Maybe they are pictures, maybe, I don't know. They can have, uh, the important part is of course, they have a width which is not the whole width of the document. If they don't have the whole width of the document, you just use this special recipe, margin zero auto, and you will find them uh, centered on the page. As you can see, the text is not centered. Only the, only the div containing the text is centered. And we will see how to center the text too. But for now, we're just centering the, the container, the div. Okay? So then we've got border. And border is pretty strange. It's not exactly the same as padding and margin. Because border is some spacing that you can add around the your, your div but it shows it shows as a border and border usually has a short hand property which has at least i think three property values one is the thickness of the border so the border can be one pixels and the second property is the style of border because you can have a solid border which is just line or you can have a dashed border, or you can have lots of different borders, and we can see them together. So I will say one pixel solid, and you can just uh, you can already see that there's a, a a black border showing up, and then you specify the color, and in this case it's just showing a black border. This is a shorthand. It's not really black. Oh, oh, okay. It's not black because I'm hovering on it. But as soon as I don't hover on it, you see that the border is actually black. And if I uh, expand the border, you will see that there are so many properties that I actually um, set. So border top color, border top style, border top width, border right color, tops uh, right style, right width. So you can specify the border properties in every single direction. But usually, well, in my experience, the border is always the same in all four directions. Sometimes it's not. For example, you can have a lighter border here, on the top left and a darker border on the bottom right in order to have some sort of a beveled, uh, a beveled uh, effect. I don't know if you know this, uh, if you ever heard of this, but let's try. Border, oh, what was that? Border top color, and I can say gray, and border left color, which is also gray. Oh, wait, wait a second, I'm messing up. Uh, left color, which is also gray. Um, let me put even uh, light gray here. You see the bevel effect? It looks, it looks facing us, you, you know? It looks like, a, a, how do you say that? Well, it's beveled. Uh, it looks 3D. And it's a very HTML1, it's a very 90s uh, effect. But it, it works. It kind of works. So you can specify multiple properties for the border. You can specify them individually, as of, of course, or you can specify them all in one uh, property value. You can adjust the thickness. So two pixels will be uh, a lot larger, a lot thicker. Three, four, five, you can do what you want. The This property can be solid, but it can have also other properties. Let's see what other properties do we have. Border CSS. Let's go to W3Schools at all, as always. And you can see this is the border style. So we've got a dotted border, dashed, solid. This is what we had. A double border, groove. Whoa. Oh, we've got also 3D effects. This is cool. So we can use, I don't know, let's try dotted border, which is pretty, pretty boring. And here it is, we've got dots. And then we've got dashed border, which is dashed. And let's try groovy. Groovy is not working. And why is it not working? Because probably this browser here doesn't understand a groovy border. Uh, oh, no, because it was groove, not groovy. <laughs> That's it, because I got it wrong. So let's put groove. Hmm, not really great. I don't know what groove should do. But it says that it's a 3D grooved border. The effect depends on the border color value. Okay, so we should put some... Uh, probably some other color. For example, what is uh, um, Alice Blue? Oh, you see? 
the beveled effect that I was talking about is actually, it looks like a, a frame, right? It looks like a frame and it doesn't look really Alice blue. Uh, let's, let's try with cornflower blue, the, the usual. Okay, yeah. So it defines the, uh, a piece of the border which is cornflower blue and another piece of the border which is a little darker to make this groove effect. This is cool, I didn't know this. You see, I'm, I'm learning new stuff. Uh, because of course, technology is advancing at a really fast pace and sometimes you don't even have time to catch up with all the news. And well, teaching is always a good occasion to run through the documentation and find new things. Ridge, what is Ridge? Let me see Ridge. Uh, of course, you can try yourself and see what... Okay, Ridge seems pretty much the same. Probably it was... Uh, uh, exactly the opposite so groove yeah it's um, it's the opposite the colors are inverted and that's it so we've got many border styles and these border styles can be applied to anything I applied these borders to a div but if I remember correctly Sao was asking me how can I add or remove borders to some table uh, should I do this with HTML no you should do this with CSS. So, for example, if you have, let me put it here. I'm going to create a table. The table has a row with a table head. Hello. Uh, let, let's put something meaningful. Um, I don't know. Lesson. And then another TH, which is ours. Okay, so I'm defining my inglorious lessons and the first row is uh, lesson one of four hours, etc, etc. Actually, every lesson is a lesson with four hours. So this is kind of a stupid table, but just to prove a point. So let's put these three like this. And I see that I have a very ugly table in here. A table that has no borders at all. By default, usually tables do have borders and the reason why this table doesn't have borders is that, if you remember, we imported the normalize CSS which was a library that we imported that completely resets all the possible rules that are automatically applied by, by the browser. But I can uh, comment out this uh, import and probably nothing happens. I still don't see any border. Okay, um, I remember that usually tables have borders, but not in this case and that's fine. I want to add a border now. So how do I add a border? So if I remember correctly, it was Sao. Sao went to table HTML and uh, she probably looked around for possible attributes of this table. Look how cool this table is and uh, she found probably that there was an attribute of the table that allowed her to specify some kind of um, I don't see this uh, some kind of border which I don't see here so probably she didn't see in this website but on another website but she found something like I don't know if it was really border uh, let's let's find it here uh, so if I add a new attribute here something like border is equal to one yeah so she found something like this border is one and if you say border is one you see some beveled border being applied the possible values here are border one or border zero which means no border at all which is the default so this is not really convenient to to use border and to customize borders so instead of using an html attribute we highly prefer instead uh, CSS, some CSS. So we are going to the style and we are going to say that the table has a border of one pixel solid gray. And if I put this, the table already has some border, but just the table, not the cells. And if you want to go a little further, you can try to add a border to the TRs or the THs and the TDs. For example, what, I, what else happens if I say TH has a border of, again, one pixel solid. Let's put another color. Um, let's put cornflower blue so this will tell the difference. 
Okay, this is probably not exactly what we expected, right? Uh, there's still some uh, spacing between the border of the table and the border of the cells. We would like the borders to overlap somehow, right? Uh, well, usually it is like this, or if you like it like this, just let's just keep it like this. Uh, let me also put a TD, so border is one pixel, solid, and I would like some green. What kind of green do we have? Green yellow is probably too too much. Oh well, yeah, it is too much, but uh, yeah, I'm not a designer. I'm more of a developer, so that's fine. So what if I want to remove all this space between cells? Well, the answer is Google is your friend. HTML table remove space between. Oh, you see, <laughs> it auto completes automatically. Remove space between rows or remove space between TD. Whatever questions you have in mind, there's someone, many people that had exactly the same question before you, and there was someone who replied to your question and usually replied on a website called Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is one of the uh, life-saving websites that we developers use because there's always people um, asking really important questions and people that are answering those questions. So this guy, if I look correctly, uh, th there's one guy that says there's an, an HTML attribute, cell spacing is equal zero, but I don't like HTML attributes and you know this already. And we also have other attributes in CSS, which look very, uh, which look better. For example, what is border collapse collapse? Let's try this. I'm going to do this uh, temporarily here. So the table should have a new property, which is border collapse, which have has different properties. Collapse, and this is actually collapsing all the borders together. So this is probably what we wanted. Inherit just means inherit from the rule that you had before. So this just means do as as always. Initial is, well, the initial value. Uh, so it's just overrides everything that was overridden. Revert, separate, unset. Uh, these are all properties that you sh usually find in every single rule. You can have inherit, initial, revert, and unset. Separate is probably what we have here. This is the default. The borders are not collapsed, they are separate. But now we know that we can use instead a collapse, which collapses all the borders. And if we like this rule, we should make it permanent inside of a CSS. So border collapse, collapse. And now this is permanent. So if I refresh the browser, I will see exactly the same borders here. Okay. Um, there was also another rule here, border spacing is zero. And let's have a look at the differences. So border, sorry, was it sport? So yeah, border spacing zero, right? Yeah, border spacing zero. Uh, it didn't do anything here, but if I remove border collapse, I see that there is a difference. So border spacing zero did a similar thing to border collapse, but the borders are not overlapped, are not collapsed together. In fact, I see this border in between two cells, which is thicker because the two borders are one next to the other and make the border double in this case. And also I can see the border of the whole table, the gray border outside, while border collapse didn't show that border at all because it was collapsed. So you can use one or the other or both because both will probably uh, be uh, working on every browser, even browsers that do not understand one of these two rules. Unfortunately, we still have this problem that some browsers don't understand one rule, but understand another one. So the best approach is always when you're creating a website is to try the website, at least on the most important browsers, uh, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Edge, maybe Internet Explorer if you need really need to, Opera, Brave, etc, etc. Um, the the good news, as I already told you, is that uh, most browsers are based on Project Chromium, which means that every browser renders pretty much the same because they have the same rendering engine inside. But there are some other browsers, such as Firefox, which instead doesn't use Chromium internally. They use Gecko as a rendering engine. So there could be some differences. 
Okay, now we know how to do borders. And I hope this is sufficient for you. We have to go a little fast. Uh, the finished product that you can see is that you can put as many properties as you want and you will have very cool uh, behaviors here. You can even uh, create uh, very creative things with the rules that you have if you experiment with them. And probably towards the end of this lesson I will show you some really strange ways to, to use CSS rules. Okay, understand now? Thank you. Awesome, Sal. Okay, so this was text, color, and spacing. About selectors, this is the most important part of the syntax of CSS. And once you know this, you can learn everything by yourself. So after I tell you about selectors, then we will start the real showcase. So about selectors, we already saw what a selector is and we use just one kind of selector. This is a type selector because it applies every property just to the type of element. Here we are saying that in the document if we have paragraphs all paragraphs will be rendered the same. But what if I want all paragraphs to be rendered the same except for specific paragraphs? Or what if I want to um, render all tables, all table rows the same, but some rows should behave differently? For example, um, you usually see tables that are rendered with white and gray rows alternating, right? Uh, which is probably a very similar thing to what we saw a while ago in this... Um, HTML tables. You see that every row is either white or gray alternatively. So how can you specify this? Um, you cannot just use an HTML element as a selector. So type selectors are what you already know. You use H1, P, the name of the tag. But you can also use special attributes such as ID and classes. And now I'll show you. So the ID in HTML is an attribute that allows you to say this thing is specific, this thing is unique. In this main tag, I'm going to say that yes, there is a paragraph that says Hello World CSS is great, but we also have another paragraph um, that says I'm special. And this paragraph, since it's special, I'm going to give you an ID. An ID is just an attribute, such, just like any other attribute, and I can give any kind of name. But as always, I, like to, I prefer to use kebab case as a convention. So I will say special dash paragraph. So all lowercase, separate, every word separated by dashes. This is called kebab case. And you already know the ID attribute because we used it, Sao used it in her awesome website that allows you to to navigate through different parts of the, uh, of, the, of the document, right? So we use the ID to navigate, to determine uniquely which section was which. But now we can also use the ID to style unique parts of our document. So this is a special paragraph and I want to treat it differently. How can I do this? Well, in HTML, I'm going to put it here. I'm going to put it uh, next to the P. I'm saying that every paragraph is like this, but the special paragraph will behave differently. And the ID selector needs a special kind of, uh, of syntax, which is the hash symbol. And you know this already because you use the hash symbol when creating links. Sao created these links. And these links, as you can see, go to originals.html hash desabafos. I really hope that I'm pronouncing thing, those things without butchering your language. But the hash, apparently, seems to be go to originals.html to the element which has this ID. So hash stands for the ID of desabafos. So hash special paragraph. As you can see, the editor is uh, showing it in blue, so it's recognizing it as a different kind of selector. In fact, this is a ID selector. And my special paragraph will have a special color, which is... I have no fantasy, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll put purple. Okay, 
So as you will see in my new homepage, this paragraph has a very common and boring color. But this special paragraph, since it's special, will have a different color. So every paragraph has a color, and I didn't specify the color, but I can. So I can say every paragraph has a color of black. Let's just be as boring as possible. So every paragraph is black, but this paragraph in particular is purple. And I'm overriding the property color black with color purple just for this paragraph. Please note that ID attributes should be as unique as possible in the page because ID means that it uniquely um, tells apart, it, it uniquely identifies one specific element in the document. Please try not to use diff the, the same ID uh, for multiple paragraphs. So if you say another paragraph is a special paragraph and says I'm also special, this will work. But this is just because the browser is resilient to our errors. But having two paragraphs with the same IDs, it means that we have two people who are actually the same person. And they are not, because they have different text. So th this is not the same. So ID should be used uniquely inside of the document. If you want to say that two paragraphs are special, but they are not unique, then we have another property, another attribute, which is the class. So let's use class. Uh, I don't want to say that this is special. I want to say that uh, this has a class of, let's say, for example, no margin. What is a P with class no margin? As the name suggests, this is a special paragraph that has no margin at all. And we can create another paragraph with the same class because classes can be applied to as many paragraphs as you want. So, um, look ma, no margins. And this paragraph says the same thing. Uh, me too, no spacing at all. Okay, we've got two paragraphs that should have no margin. And how they render now, exactly the same. They have margins because I didn't write any uh, any sort of, um, of, of rule that triggers the no margin. But now, in the CSS, I can use this other syntax, which starts with a dot. The dot is the identifier for classes. So, dot no margin, as you can see, has a different color. It's not... I'm sorry, maybe it was a little too small. Um, so, as you can see, it's a different color that rather than uh, the uh, element selector and the ID selector. And this is a set of rules that I'm going to write and they will be applied to every element which has a class of no margin. So, here I can say margin is zero. And if I say margin zero, or I can also say margin none, which is a new thing that I haven't told you before, it's exactly the same. I'm saying that I don't want any margin. And you see that probably it didn't work because margin none doesn't work. Okay, let's do margin zero. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought that margin none worked. Nope. Uh, but maybe padding none, it works. No, not even. Okay, I think this is quite new. I always created margin none. Um, okay, so the rule is... The rule is margin zero, and in fact, you can see those two paragraphs have no margin anymore. But this one has, because this is a paragraph that has only the, only the P and the special paragraph applied, but not the no margin uh, rule. If I want to add the no margin rule, then I can add a class attribute, and I say no margin, no margin, and now this paragraph has no margin. So with class, with the class selector, with the class attribute that you apply on the HTML, you can define a, speci a specific set of elements that should share the same kind of rules. While the ID is usually one element which is so special that it must have its own rules will, which will never be shared by anyone else. Um, 
Another thing that I would like to tell you about margins, however, is another special property. So I'm going to switch off the no margin property. And look what happens here. Um, this paragraph has margin on top and on the bottom, right? And this paragraph has margins on the bottom and on the top. But the top margin of this paragraph is overlapping with the bottom margin of this paragraph. You see, there's no double margin in between these two. And this is another special property of margins. M when uh, we have two elements, if I remember correctly, if, is, is like this. If we have two elements of the same kind, so two paragraphs or uh, two H1s, and they have margin in between, those margins will not be added, but they will be overlapped. So this is why we have margin on top and margin on bottom, but actually the margin in between is just one margin. It's not twice the amount of margins. And well, this is convenient, especially for paragraphs, because we don't want double the amount of space in here. We want even space between these paragraphs. Okay, so this is how it works. Uh, I don't like this uh, property actually. In fact, usually in my uh, experience, in my work experience, I usually try to say that the margin top of the paragraph is always zero. I like it like this because in this case I have more control. Still, there is some margin between the paddings, but that margin is just the bottom margin of each paragraph. I like it better, but uh, it's just my particular taste. Okay, so we found out what classes are about and usually classes are really 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 important and we'll see them also in a while in uh, multiple occasions. Uh, I used a lot of classes in this website. In fact, whenever you see some rule applied, I never apply rule, well, except for <laughs> yeah, some exceptions. For example, this main tag has some rules applied. It has the background applied. But this section has no rules attached to the section element. It just has rules applied to the hero class and the container class. What is a container? Uh, if you see this from for the first time, you probably don't know what a container is. And that's, uh, of course, natural. But apparently, if I see someone creating this kind of class, it seems like the container is something that contains element and adds this margin on the left and on the right automatically. Uh, so I'm probably applying the, um, let me see, yep, I'm applying the recipe that I told you already, margin zero auto. So the container is something that has a fixed width that contains everything and is centered in the page. And this is what's happening here. So as you can see, the container is always there centered. The margin gets bigger or shorter, but the container is always centered in the page. So I, I said to myself, there's many things inside of this page that should be not spanning the whole width of the, uh, of the page. They should be uh, a little shorter and they should always be centered. If there are so many sections like this, then let's create a class called container and I will apply some rules to this container that allow me to do this, uh, this kind of job. And then every section that needs to have these rules applied will just have a class of container. This section is also the... Hello, I'm so clumsy that I, that I banged on the microphone and probably muted it for a, one second, but I'm here. Uh, so um, this hero section is probably unique in all the page. So I could have used the ID of hero, but still I'm used to classes more than IDs. So I said every section that is a hero should have this class hero in here and should have some rules applied to it. I'm not going into detail for now about the rules, but one thing that I'm, sh I'm starting to show you here is that the ID is always unique and a paragraph has only one ID, but classes can be multiple. So this, this paragraph could be of class no margin, but also, uh, I don't know, a middle class. 
and you separate the different classes with just a space. So you can have one paragraph that has multiple classes, so you can apply a combination of different rules together to that uh, paragraph. Okay, middle class has no rules attached, but you can use multiple classes inside of an element. And this is pretty cool because you can combine multiple properties, multiple rules together in the same element. Uh, let's see this example. We have a class of important, which has font weight bold and a border of two pixels with a special color and solid. And then we've got a paragraph and this paragraph has a class of important. What happens in this case? We see that the text is bold and we have a really ugly border applied to this specific paragraph because it's important. Every paragraph that we have in the document that we say it's important will have this class and will be rendered this way. Um, as you can see here it says that you can apply multiple class names just by separating them with a space. Or you can combine ID and class. So you can have uh, two classes, two paragraphs that have no margin, but this paragraph here is also a special one. Oh my god, okay. This is a special paragraph. What's wrong with this code? I'm waiting five seconds. The thing that is wrong with this code is that now I have two paragraphs with the same ID, and I already told you I don't want to have uh, multiple uh, unique IDs in the same uh, document. So I, either this paragraph or this one should be special. And if I do this, let's see what happens. Now I have one paragraph which says that it's special, but it's actually not special at all. This paragraph has a class of no margin, so it has no margins applied. This paragraph has no margin too, but also, since it's a special paragraph, it also has a color of purple. So you see, I'm combining rules coming from different rule sets, just by applying different selectors. We also have various kinds of selectors that we can apply. For example, there's this kind of selector, which is the descendant element. So you can say parent selector, space, child selector, and then you define properties. Uh, maybe it's much better if we see those examples instead of trying them out, all of them, because it can be really, really boring uh, to write, test, and see. Uh, now we're going to see things that are pretty obvious probably for you. If they are not obvious, just tell me and I will try to, um, to, to explain them further and make an example about them. But uh, for things that I find trivial, I will go a little faster here. So, for example, if you have a class important, it means that it should have font weight bold and some border, and that's fine. But a descendant element inside of the class important and a descendant which is a B should have a color of this kind. What does this mean? Well, let's see this HTML. We've got a body with a P, a paragraph that is of class important. So this paragraph will have these rules applied. But this paragraph also has a B tag inside. And here there's a typo made by Ryan because he wanted to type and LT less than because he wanted to create the less than symbol with the HTML entity, but he misspelled, so he wrote TL instead of LT. But just ignore that. This is a bold tag inside of a paragraph. And since this bold tag is a descendant of the paragraph tag, this rule will be applied because this is a B inside contained descendant of an important um, paragraph or an important element. Bobby says, so does the rem refer to the main HTML box which holds your hero container? So when you added the first large picture, you were able to add another one on top and move it towards the bottom of the HTML container and out of the larger background picture. I don't know if that makes any sense. It does, but it's telling a story that I haven't uh, told yet. I didn't say anything about REM, so I'm not going to say it now, but I will say it in a while. Um, yeah, so uh, when I moved the picture towards the bottom, is it was not due to the REM property, which I haven't explained. It's due to the negative margin. In fact, if I take this uh, right 
div, it has a class of write, and the hero write has a margin bottom of minus 5 rem. But I could have written minus 50 pixels to too small. Uh, 100 pixels, or even two, let's exasperate, 200 pixels. So a negative margin bottom in pixels will shift this element outside of its bounding box. It's not a matter of rem. And here you are starting to see some sort of a string selector that I haven't explained yet, but I will explain it in a while. It's very similar to the descendant selector that I just showed you right now. So we've got a selector for a class and a selector for a descendant. This, mean, this means every B that is a descendant, that is contained inside of an element of class important, will have these rules applied. And this is what happens. This is an important paragraph, but a B inside of an important paragraph apparently has this color, which is kind of reddish. Well, this other here is a paragraph that contains another B, but this paragraph doesn't have a class of important. So this B is pretty normal. This has no rules applied because it's a B inside of a paragraph, but it's not in inside of a paragraph that was labeled as important. Okay? We can also combine selectors together. So if we want the same exact rules applied to the two different kinds of selectors, we can separate them with commas. So for example, no, no examples here, but still, you can use something like, uh, uh, for example, I use this thing a lot. Um, sometimes I write this kind of rule, HTML, body, and even an element called root should have a margin of zero. This is something that, uh, and uh, I've got an auto formatter that puts every selector on a new line. And this is fine, probably it's even uh, better looking and uh, easier to, to read like this. So if I separate multiple selectors with commas, all these rules will be applied to all three selectors. And this is pretty useful because usually HTML body and other elements are by default uh, do, they do have a margin. So in fact, this is the rule that I applied, but by default, the body has a margin of eight pixels. So this, rules, this rule that I created usually resets the default margin throughout the whole document. So the HTML, the body, and sometimes we do have a div that is the root of the document. We don't have it here, but yeah, we can have a div with an ID of root this, uh, you will see lots of these kind of divs when you, uh, when you further look at um, uh, frameworks such as um, React.js or something like that. We usually have a div with an ID root. It's just a way to not apply styles to the body and to make things happen to some other div that have uh, no conflict with the, with the body. So we can have a, a root, whoops, okay. We have HTML, we've got a body, we've got a root, and all of the three will have zero margin applied. So this is the multiple selector, and it could be useful. Um, we've got a pseudo, is it called pseudo selector? Uh, I don't remember if it's called pseudo selector, but still, we've got a selector that can be applied to an element or a tag or a class or an ID only when you hover on it. Um, so, if you have a paragraph with this colon hover, then these rules will, apply, will be applied to the paragraph, but only if you hover on this paragraph. You see? And this can be useful in multiple cases. For example, let's do this uh, very stupid example. Let's create a link. Ahref, I don't know, Google. Ah, it, com. Um, let's put the HTTPS, otherwise I don't think it will work. Google is your friend. So we've got a link, and this link shows pretty ugly. In, in fact, it, well, for once, it's purple, and I cannot even see it. I'm really, 
I'm really writing very bad HTML, which is not really easy on the eyes. So I'm sorry for this. Um, I would like to maybe switch off all the rules that I created so far. And I can switch them off by commenting them out. Do you remember comments? Comments in HTML are made like this. Very strange. This is a comment in HTML. So it's less than exclamation mark dash dash. And then you end with dash dash greater than symbol. But comments in CSS are a little easier. They start with a slash asterisk and they close with a slash asterisk. And you can uh, comment one line or a whole block of code. And comments are really important to add some meaningful information for you, for the developer, which is not meaningful for the interpreter, for the browser. So here be dragons. This is for me or for everyone, every developer that uh, reads this, uh, this comment, but not for the browser because it, the browser will not interpret this comment as valid CSS code. So you can comment things or you can switch them off without totally removing them. Okay, so I'm muting my code in, in some sort of way. Uh, if I mute all my code, this is what happens. I still have some, um, some style applied but the style is being applied because of the theme CSS, which is another CSS file that I have included in my page here. If I don't want this theme to be applied, I can comment it out in HTML, as you can see, and now everything is completely devoid of uh, styling. So I can start styling again. Uh, I don't know if you are comfortable with all this commenting out, commenting in, etc., etc. In order to be comfortable with all these things, you have to practice. Please do some practice. It's pretty important right now, uh, while we are doing simple things like HTML and CSS, it will be crucial as soon as we do JavaScript. Because without practicing, JavaScript will completely be unintelligible to you. Uh, it will look like you understand everything when I'm writing code, but as soon as you try things out, you will feel really, really stupid at first. And you have to practice in order to master the art, the craft. So, as I was saying, uh, this link is really ugly. So I want to say that every anchor link should be more good looking. For example, I love the color cornflower blue applied to links. So I'm going to apply this color and I like it better. But when I hover on the link, I want the link to be uh, to, to show up a little more because I want the user to understand that this is a clickable link. So I'm going to say a colon hover and this is the new selector that tells me this is a link but these rules will be applied only when I hover on the link. And now I will have another kind of color, let's say just blue. Okay, so the link stays cornflower blue, but as soon as I hover on it, it becomes blue. Ooh, this blue is really ugly in here, but yeah, it works. Okay, so this is the hover selector. Pretty easy to grasp. Uh, pseudo elements. So we've got some pseudo elements uh, which allow you to select specific things inside of an element. For example, selector one first line or selector one first letter or uh, we even have the before and after which are pretty difficult to master and I will show some examples later maybe. Um, we've got first child but I don't see the first child. Nope, I don't see the first child. So let's uh, look at one example. CSS paging Let's see an example of this. No, not this one. Not this one. Okay, this one here. Look at these buttons. These buttons are, as you can see, they have a different style when I hover on them. And this is the hover selector that I just showed you, probably. Let's see if it's true. Uh, this is an A with a border and uh, not much things, but if I hover on this A, it probably triggers another rule. But I don't see this rule being applied here. So how do I see this rule applied? Well, there is one special button in here, HOV, 
that if you click on it, it will allow you to force the element state. And as you can see, there are so many states that we can apply. We can see that the element is active, it has focus or it has focus within, it has over, visited, focus visible. If I click on hover on this checkbox, now I'm forcing the hover state on this button. And finally, I see a new, um, a new rule being applied. In fact, it seems that Look at this. Uh, there's many things that you now should know, and some of them you sh you you not you do not know. Uh, UL dot pagination three. This is a combination of saying that this rule will be applied to any UL, any unordered list, but an unordered list which has a class of pagination three. There's no space in between. So this means that you can combine both the element and the class together. This is every UL that has a class of pagination three, not just pagination three or UL. This is the descendant selector. So every LI of that specific kind of UL. And this is another descendant element. So every A of every LI of every UL of class pagination three, but not just any A, but also any A that is being hovered. And we also have this other kind of selector, not active, which I haven't explained yet, but we will see it in a while. But still, let, let's just uh, not care about this dot not. Every link that is being hovered inside of an LI, inside of a UL, with a class of pagination, will have a background color of DDD, which is this gray here. And this rule is also applied to another kind of pagination. So this, as you can see, is two different selectors. UL pagination to li a hover not active. And let's get rid of the not active if I can. No, I cannot. Yeah, I can. Let's just look at it like this. So this rule will be applied to every link that is being hovered inside of an li inside of a ul either of pagination 2 class or pagination 3 class i don't know what pagination 3 or pagination 2 classes are and i don't care in this moment but still this is being hovered and this has a background of gray if i switch off the hover it means that i'm not forcing the hover state and this rule will be applied actually when i when i really hover on this button but what I wanted to show you also is that every single button here is completely perfectly squared except for the left one and the rightmost one. So the first uh, LI in this pagination uh, UL and the rightmost, the first element and the last element. And I'm pretty sure that this is achieved through some rules which are these ones here. Okay, so this has a rule of border top left radius, border and bottom left radius, which I haven't explained, but you, it can suggest you that it's uh, rounding the corners on the top left and on the bottom left by four pixels. And this is applied to the LI of pagination three, which is the first child. Well, actually it's the link inside of the first child of the LI. I know it's a little complex and it's a mouthful, but it's actually uh, easier to write and read than to, to, to tell. You see that these radiuses are applied to the link, which is contained inside of the LI, which is the first child of the UL. And that's why only this button has rounded corners on the left. And the same goes with the last element. The last element has this rule, dot pagination three, space, li, last child as a pseudo element, a. So the link inside of an li, which is the last child of a pagination three, will have rounded corners on the top right and on the bottom right. And this is how you achieve this kind of uh, uh, button set with rounded corners only on specific places on the leftmost and on the rightmost. So we've got these pseudo elements, which sometimes you can see with the double column, sometimes you can see with a single column. And I have to confess that I never understood the difference. I think that one of them is more standard than the other, but I really don't know. Uh, and if you want to know, pseudo elements, CSS, single or double column and as you can see google already know what what i'm what i'm talking about 
Okay, we've got a page by CSS Tricks and we're going to see a lot of uh, pages from this awesome website because it tells you some really, really cool tricks on CSS. And know the double column, column, column before versus the single column, column before. Which one is correct? Well, technically, the correct answer is column, column before. Yeah, this is the standard. But that doesn't mean you should automatically use it. The situation is that double column selectors are pseudo elements, while single column selectors are pseudo selectors. So, for example, this selector, this element here, column, column before, is definitely a pseudo element, so it should use the double column. The distinction between a pseudo element and a pseudo selector is already confusing. Fortunately, after and before are fairly straightforward. The literally adds something new to the page, an element, while first letter and other pseudo selectors do something else. Um, let's do. Let's wrap it up. Single column pseudo elements were a mistake. There will never be any more pseudo elements with a single column. If you have the distinction straight in your mind, might as well train your fingers to do it right. This is already confusing enough. So let's just follow the correctly spessed way. Spessed way. Okay. Yeah. During, uh, following the specs. Um, bottom line, I actually use the single column every time because it's shorter and it's more readable. And I do have tools that if this is not correct or this is not standard, will automatically correct my syntax uh, as soon as I ship my website online. So I don't really, really care. If it works, I will use this. Okay, so we've got these selectors and we cannot just test them all, but we've got the selector for first letter. And if you're curious about it, you can say first letter pseudo element in CSS and you can find some cool, some cool examples. Let's see if this has an example here. Try it yourself. Here it is. You can have beautiful first letters in your paragraph and it can look like you're writing goth books. This is pretty cool. And the only thing that you have to remember from this lesson, from this showcase lesson, is that these things exist. And that's it. You have to know that there is a pseudo selector that allows you to trigger the first letter inside of a CSS. And if you don't know how to use it, just Google it. It's a matter of one second. You always find something useful on Google or on Bing or on DuckDuckGo, whatever. Um, the before selector and after selectors are pretty interesting and they allow you to do very curious stuff that I'm going to tell you at the end of this lesson probably, but I'm not going to show you right now. And you can overlap rules. If you say that an, uh, a UL has this color, but a UL of this class has another color, but a UL of this ID has another color, well, these rules will overlap and there will be some rules that win over other rules. Uh, is there a, a specific way that one rule is winning um, the race between the properties? Yes, there is some sort of precedence. There are some precedence rules. So a tag element has the lowest precedence. If you say, if you use a class selector, this will definitely override the tag. And if you use the ID, this will override the class and the tag, which is kind of um, uh, intuitive. In fact, we can say every paragraph has these rules, but paragraphs of this class will have these special rules. But this special paragraph, which is so special that it needs an ID, will have a different rule. So, of course, the ID will win over any rules that are applied to the class, and the class will win over any rule that will be applied to just the element selector. Okay? I think it's pretty basic, but if you didn't, if you cannot find a, a meaning to this, we can further explain it. So don't worry, you can always ask, you can always interrupt me on things that I explained and you're not able to make your mind upon it. Um, best practice, okay, there's a little bit of um, 
of suggestions about best practices, which I would suggest you to read. This is all part of the material that you're supposed to read and to make exercise about in your practice time. So please do some exercise. I would love to do some exercises with you during my spare time. Uh, we can arrange them together, uh, but I cannot do those exercises in here during the lessons, otherwise we will not be um, fast enough. We will do some exercises together with the JavaScript part, because that needs a lot more exercise than HTML and CSS. There's also some uh, good rules of thumb that address performance. Okay, it's just links to Google. Um, some rules, uh, if you write them, are more performant than other rules. Uh, for example, one rule of thumb about performance that I used to know, but probably it's not valid anymore, is that if you use the ID selector, this is a little more performant than using the, the class selector. And why is that? Because if you think about it, the browser should style every element in the DOM, we call it, the do document object model, in the document, okay? So the browser should uh, scan through all the different elements in the document and try to apply a special style to each element. So as soon as the uh, browser finds a div with an ID, they say, well, the ID is unique. So as soon as I find the div with ID root, I will apply this, the rules to this ID and then I will not look any further for other divs that have the same ID because the ID should be unique. So the browser applies the rule and stops there. Well, for class, the class can be replicated multiple times. So as soon as the browser uh, stumbles upon a paragraph with a class of no margin, it applies the rules to no margin and then looks for other elements that could have the same class of no margin. This was in theory, but in reality, it's not like this. As I already showed you, if I add the same ID here, and I apply the same rule to the same ID. So let me do it like this. Every special paragraph should have a color of purple. As you can see, the color is applied to both elements with the same ID. So the browser is not doing any performance tweaks uh, by ignoring the next elements with the same ID. So there are some uh, CSS performance rules that used to be valid a while ago, but due to uh, resilience of browsers, they cannot be applied anymore. There are still some uh, rules of thumb that we can uh, think about, but not in this environment, just uh, a little further. I'm not going to go further on colors, except for the fact that if you don't want plain colors, you can add gradients. So how many ways do we have to create plain colors? Four. And we covered them all. We have the hexadecimal code, we have the RGB, we have the HSL syntax, or we also have named colors such as crimson or dark blue. And we use these a lot because I don't want to deal with uh, numeric codes. Um, we've got color pickers, of course, so we're not even uh, forced to write those, co those colors. Um, Colors can be applied in multiple properties, for example, color, which sets the font color, background color, which sets the, the color of the background, of course, and border color, which we implicitly used to set the color of a border. You remember border with a value of one pixel solid gray. Gray is the border color property. Um, not covering these because we already told everything that we need to, to know, even RGB a with this fourth parameter that tells you the transparency, the alpha. And as you can see, the transparency in action will uh, even blend the colors together if they overlap. And how do they overlap? With a negative margin. As you can see, H1 and P are overlapping because the paragraph has a negative margin. So it's going a little higher than it should be, it's going to overlap. And since those two elements have, well, since the paragraph has a background color, which has some transparency, you will see the two colors blend together. 
But the most important and new thing that I can tell you here is that we can use gradients. And gradients are not really easy to use. In fact, uh, I never write a gradient by hand. I usually use um, some sort of external tool that allows me to define gradients. And probably if I click on here, I will see such a tool. No, always uh, some Google link. But the first link could be good. Let's see, linear gradients. No, this is an explanation of linear gradients. So um, let's try this other link, UI gradients. Woo. Okay, okay. This, as you can see, is a gradient background that goes from some shade of bluish to some shade of grayish. And probably you can uh, change the colors here. Show all gradients. Okay, these are predefined gradients that you can copy. But this is not what I wanted. Let me check CSS gradient online. Usually when I do something like this, it allows me to generate a gradient and this is it. So here we've got a gradient that starts from a dark, really dark blue and then on 35% of the width of this bar it starts sh moving to a different shade of blue. So as you can see at 0% of the bar we have this color here which is really really dark blue. At 35% we move, we shift to this dark blue, which is a little lighter, and on 100% of the bar, we finally move to this other shade of blue, which is more uh, uh, cyan, probably. And, uh, but we can trigger this thing. We can move different uh, breakpoints. We can add different breakpoints. We can make this start from, uh, yeah, bluish, but then go to greenish. And then on 76% we go to orangish. And then at the end we go to yellowish, which is a very bad gradient, but it works. As you can see, we can put color stops or we can remove color stops. I don't know how, but we can definitely remove these color stops. Oh, we can remove them here. Okay, so now we've just got uh, one gradient that, I don't know, starts from zero, goes to 100, and on zero starts with green, 100 stops with yellow. And um, this is a linear gradient, but we can have a radial. And radial gradient means that it spans from the center towards the, uh, towards the periphery. So as you can see here behind, the green is at the center and it irradiates towards yellow. It doesn't show too much. Uh, maybe we can uh, switch those two. Let's see if we can. Yep. Okay. This looks... Uh, now you can see it. it looks like the sun, right? Uh, it goes from a yellow to... Let's go to a bluish. Okay. Something like this. And this is a radial gradient. So we can decide if you want a radial gradient or a linear gradient that goes from one side to the other side. But the sides are not necessary from left to right. In fact, you can specify an angle. It was by default an angle of 90 degrees, but you can have it as an angle of uh, zero degrees or 360, which means that the gradients start from the top to the bottom. Or in this case, I think it spans from the bottom to the top because it starts with yellow on the bottom and then on the top it goes uh, blue. And so I can trigger and I can tweak whatever I want here. I can even use predefined gradients apparently here. And then this is the resulting code. So I just need to copy this code and paste it in, in, my, in my style sheets. And as you can see, it's using the background property. And the background property is pretty complex. It's a linear gradient that has an angle of 90 degrees. You remember the angle that we say here and starts with an RGBA like this at 17% and stops with an RGBA of this color at 73%. These percentages are what I have here, but I can start with zero and you will see that this starts with 0% and stops with 100%. What if I use a color stop? I put a color stop here at 50% and this is going to be purplish. And this is what happens. Linear gradient is still 90 degrees, starts at 0% with this color, then stops at 50% with this color, and finally ends at 100% with this other color. 
Do I want it vertical instead of uh, horizontal? I just shift the degrees to 180 and this is exactly what, what changed in the resulting CSS code, 180 degrees instead of 90 degrees. Do I want it radial? I click on this and now it's a radial gradient instead of a linear gradient and in fact it's going radial instead of linear. So. Bottom line, colors can be difficult to use, especially if you try to code them and, uh, and, and write the codes. So don't, just use online tools or the tools that are provided by Visual Studio Code or your editor of choice to define the color shades, the gradients, etc. And then these tools will usually auto-generate the CSS code that you need and then you can just copy and paste the color codes there. Why are there two backgrounds here? Well, the fact is that some really, really old browsers do not understand gradients. So this is the fold back property. If your browser doesn't understand gradients, it will fall back to this plain color, which is uh, understood by every browser. Uh, but instead, if your browser understands radial gradients, it will try at first to use the plain color, but it will override the color with this radial gradient. So let's copy this to clipboard and see what happens. I will put this color into the root element for some reason. That's it. Uh, my auto formatter decided to put this complex rule into um, multiple lines, which is probably better. And Visual Studio Code also is showing me a preview of these colors, which I can probably even change uh, on the fly. And what happens to on my website? Ooh, nice. Well, nice, <laughs> this is a, a strong word, but still, yeah, it, it works. Let's say just that it works, okay? So colors are pretty easy to use and understand and to grasp, especially if you don't do the work yourself, uh, but you make the machine work, the, make the work for you. Um, is there anything you have to say about colors? No, this is the summary. Remember that at the end of each of Ryan's tutorials, we have activities. So do these activities. These are cool exercises. You don't need to come up with your own exercises if you don't have the creativity that Tiago or Sao has. Um, you can come up with your own uh, website or your own uh, exercise and that's awesome. But if you don't have this fantasy, you can ask me or you can find some exercises to do as activities at the end of each chapter of Ryan's tutorials. So this concludes the basics of... Uh, of uh, CSS and now we're going to go through the intermediate uh, concepts, the advanced concepts and even concepts that go beyond CSS and hopefully we will be able to do all of this in one lesson or one lesson and a half. Why is that? Because this is a very boring showcase of every single thing that you can do with CSS. But I think that apart from uh, specific things, you already understood how to approach CSS. It's just lots and lots of things that you can do. You just need to know that they exist. You know, just need to know the names of those things that you can achieve and then you just Google them and you can be held by any tool that is online. Um, we're still eight minutes before the coffee break. So let's, let's do this. Pseudo classes, we already did this. And I don't think we need to say more than what we already saw. Uh, yeah, there are so many pseudo classes. For example, a visited triggers the fact that the link was already visited or not. In fact, uh, I don't know if you saw this already, but in your HTML pages, the link is usually shown in blue. But once you visited that link, that link is permanently purple. So this is how you can trigger links. A link by itself, A, doesn't even mean need to have this uh, colon link, which I don't even know what, oh, unvisited link. Okay, so unvisited links have a color of blue by default and visited links have a color of purple by default. Is that true? Let's see one of your websites, Tiago. 
All these links have been visited. In fact, they are purple. This link is not visited because I don't want, didn't want to bother Tiago by calling him. But if I unvisit, for example, if I open a new browser window with the incognito mode, all these links appear as non-visited. But as soon as I visit them and I go back, well, no, in incognito mode, uh, no information about my navigation is preserved. So it still looks like non-visited. Um, and that proves my point, actually, in, uh, in a special way. Yeah, these links are always unvisited in uh, incognito mode. But when I'm not in incognito mode, the browser remembers that I already visited this link, so it becomes purple. If I don't want it to, to be purple, I can just say that a link which is visited will have another color, for example, cornflower blue. And now all these visited links will be cornflower blue, except for the unvisited link, which is this one, which is still blue. But I still, I can have an A, which has a color of uh, dark gray, I don't know. And now this link is gray because it's unvisited, but every other link which is visited is actually cornflower blue. I don't know if we really need that pseudo link thing. I think it has exactly the same meaning, so I don't care about this uh, colon link. I never used it in my life. I didn't even know about it. Dynamic pseudo classes, uh, active hover focus. We already talked about this. We already try to use hover. We also have other things like input focus, text area focus, which means that as soon as you click inside of a text input, the, uh, the text input will have some focus and you can tweak the behavior of this input by, for example, placing a blue border around it to show that that input has focus. Um, we can have pseudo elements such as first child, last child, which I showed you when I showed you the uh, pagination buttons. And that's it for pseudo classes. Then we can have... Okay, this is about shorthand properties. And I already told you almost everything about this. So we can use padding top, padding left, or you can use margin or padding, which are shorthand properties in which you can place four properties in the same line. And padding is the same thing as margin. Border is one huge example of uh, shorthand properties because we usually write borders as one pixel red solid or one pixel solid red. But this has a meaning of three different separate properties altogether. Border width, border color, and border style. Um, you can say do this, the same thing with fonts, which personally I never did in my life and I never saw in, in other people's codes. So you can say that the font is italic bold, 12 pixel divided by two, whatever this means, and uh, courier, which is the font family. But usually I use font family, font weight, font size, and I think that italic is something that we haven't seen before, but uh, we will see it in a while. Then we've got backgrounds. So. The background can be a plain color, it can be a gradient, but it can also have images, if you like a background image, such as this. We have an image as a background of this piece of uh, section. So in here we can see that background is another shorthand property because background color, which is a property that we already saw before, is just one of the properties that you can set with the background property, the shorthand property. In fact, background of white URL with some URL, no repeat, top, right, is so many properties together. This is driving the background color by default because if the image is not loaded, then it will fall back to just a white background. But if the image is loaded, then this is the background image property uh, that you can see here, background image. The image, if it's small, you can tile it and cover your website with tiles. So you can repeat the image. And I think that by default it is repeating. So if you don't want it to be repeated, you have to specify no repeat. I didn't want to repeat this image. I want it to be just unique in the page. So that's why I have this image here. Um, let me see if I can show you, yeah, this is the background repeat, no repeat, but I'm pretty sure that the image is so huge 
You see, if I if I remove some of the properties that I haven't even explained yet, you see that the image is repeated, is tiled. So you want to have a no repeat uh, image, which is here, but it, it's, it's ugly because we need some more properties to, to define. But still, no repeat allows to not repeat, not tile the images. Then we've got these top right, which is the background position because the background can be centered in your uh, containing uh, div or your containing document or you can put it on the top left etc etc this kind of image is like this because it's a small image not repeated and placed on the top right of its container and you can see it's here but there are so many other properties that you can uh, add to images and we'll see them later but for now, we'll have a coffee break. I hope this lesson is not boring for you. I can go even faster or I can go even slower if I'm puzzling you too much. So don't worry. For in the meantime, let's have a coffee break and we'll see in 15 minutes. So for my time, it will be 12.15. Have a good coffee break. Bye.
15 minutes later. Here we are again. Hi. So I hope you had a good coffee. I did. And I also created a new technical problem. I have issues muting my microphone. So at first you could hear my background voice. Uh, but now I see that everything is working back again. So we're back to business. I see the viewers going from six to nine. So people are going back to watching. Hi, welcome back. And uh, we can continue this showcase of all the features that we can see and use in CSS. I know it's boring. The future lessons will not be like this. Uh, they will be a completely different kind and we'll do a lot more practice. Uh, this time it's just looking at stuff. I know, I know, it can be boring. But still, we've got lots of backgrounds and we've got uh, one slide about specificity, which I already mentioned. In fact, there is a number associated to selectors. In fact, tag selectors, I have a specificity of one. Class selector, I have a specificity of 10. ID selectors have a specificity of 100, which means that if I have two paragraphs which have overlapping rules, well, since this is a cascading style sheet, this rule, the latest rule, will win over the first rule because the second rule will just override the first rule. But if uh, my first rule is a bit more specific, for example, not just a P, but a P which is a descendant of a div, then this rule is a little more specific. Of course, because I'm saying every paragraph should be blue, but paragraphs that are inside of a div should have the color of red. So even if this first rule is written above the second one, this is more specific and it will win. If you really want to calculate specificity, and I don't suggest you to do that because it involves some maths and it's pretty stupid to do that, but still, an element such as P has a specificity of one. If you say div space P, this is a paragraph which is a descendant of a div, this has a specificity of two because we've got two HTML selectors, one plus one. A class has a specificity defined as 10 because it's a class selector. And if I say div space p.tree, this has a specificity of 12 because we've got two elements, a paragraph which is a descendant of a div, but this paragraph is more specific than any other paragraph inside of the same div because it also has a class of tree. So it's one plus one plus the 10 that we have from the class. Baobab is really, really specific because it's an ID selector and IDs are special and have a specificity of 100. So if you see body, space, the descendant of a body with an ID of content, and inside of this content we have a class of alternative which contains a P, this can be calculated as a specificity of 112. I don't even care why. Um, so this is it. You can define multiple rules and you can override some rules by triggering their specificity or you can understand why some rules are applied rather than others by analyzing the specificity of their selectors. And finally, there is one slide that I really, really wanted to show you for a long time because this is what Bobby was asking about. Bobby is asking, is EM or REM defining how the image is overlapping uh, over some other image or not? No, nothing of which. Uh, there's other rules and uh, so many rules that are being applied there. One of the most important rule for overlapping is the negative margin, which could be also in uh, pixels. Uh, EM and REM are just uh, units of measure, just like saying uh, inches or uh, centimeters. Uh, they are special units of measures, so we are going to address them, we're going to look at them. But what I'm saying is that it's not a matter of EM or REM, it's the negative margin. In fact, if I increase the negative margin by approaching zero, you will see that this guy is not overlapping. 
Whereas if the margin gets more and more negative, and I'm doing this by just uh, uh, using the up and down arrow keys. This is a cool thing that we can do in, uh, in the developer tools. You can just select the value and just go up and down with your arrow keys to trigger the behavior. So as you can see, it's just a matter of negative margin in any kind of unit of measure unit. This is in pixels, but I can do the same with REM and this would be exactly the same thing. You see? So, but there's also a, a matter of display. Let's have a look at some of the display options that we have. So, the most important displays that we have are inline, block, and also none. Inline is a kind of display that allows you to have one element that just shows, well, let's say as text. In fact, for example, spans have a display of inline by default. If you use a span, uh, let's create um, let's create something here, uh, a paragraph with a span, and uh, I'm a span, while I'm not, okay? So let's have a look at what happens. I'm a span while I'm not. This span doesn't have any special rules at all. It's just text. It's text wrapped inside of a specific element. And now I'm going to reply to Angelo. I'm sorry for replying so late. But if you want this span to be bold, instead of using the strong element, if you want, you can just call it a span and add a class of uh, strong, for example. If you do like this, you can create a new CSS rule in which you say that everything that is strong should have a font weight of bold. You see? So you're not even using the strong tag, you're just using a generic tag called span, but applying a special class that you decided to define. And you can define whatever you want. For example, there's also a class that I can create like shouted, and in the shouted class, I can say, well, this is a rule that I never showed you, but you can tr create a text transform in which everything is uppercase. I'm a span! Now the text is shouted, okay? So you can create whatever you want. Strong is right as a tag, but it tells you the kind of tag. In, with span, you just have a generic tag, and then you can add whatever classes you want. You can even combine classes together. So this is shouted and also strong. And now we've got two rules being applied, uh, the uppercase one and the font weight bold one. Okay, so I usually prefer to use just spans. But what I wanted to show you here is that the span has a width and a height that are automatically computed by the dimension, the size of their content. So the span, how big is it? Is it? It's big as the I'm a span text tells it to, to be. And that's it. So this is by default a display of inline. This is how display inline works. While divs or uh, actually also mains and uh, probably also headers and other uh, kind of elements, by default they have another kind of display. Let's see div with id root. If I see computed, I will see that the display now is block. And block is different because the block element, an element that has a display of block, will always try to span the whole width, not of the whole document per se, but of its container. Okay, so inline spans the width of its content, of what's inside, and display block spans the width of the thing that it's containing it. And this, um, well, yields to the conclusion that everything that is a display of block will have everything um, next to it actually placed below because there's not enough room to place something next to it. So display block is what allows you to have everything on, a, on, a, on different lines, while display inline is what is making things go 
one next to the other in the same line. Images are also display in line and you know them already. Uh, you saw that an image will, will be in the same line as the text that you write. And if you want to make it on a new line, you, you have to do multiple things. You can place that image inside of a div, which automatically makes ev anything else go to a new line. Or you can place it in a paragraph, because paragraphs also are a display block. They also add some margin. So remember uh, that paragraphs are special. And usually paragraphs should hold, well, yeah, they can hold images, but ma mainly text. And uh, another thing that we did was uh, use a BR tag, which breaks the line forcefully. And now you can even uh, use another thing, which is adding a CSS property to your image by saying that the image should be display block. I wouldn't recommend it, <laughs> but you can. There's so many things that you can do. And uh, let's close this one. So display inline is what makes these texts being inline, on the same line. Well, display block will make these uh, blocks of code span the whole width of their container. So necessarily every block should be on a new line. And there's also display none, which allows you to hide completely the, the element. There's also another way to hide things, which is visibility hidden but it has a slightly different behavior and I will probably sh show you. So let's see what happens if I hide this paragraph. If this paragraph has a display of none, as you can see, it completely disappeared from the screen and everything that was below it goes up, covering the space that was previously covered by this element. You see the difference? Google is your friend goes above. But if instead of display none, I use visibility hidden, well, the element disappears, but it still takes its space. So as you can see, things are not going above, are, are not moving upwards, uh, covering the space. So this is the difference between display none and visibility hidden. Display none, Visibility hidden, okay? Um, that's it. As for tables, well, we've got a special kind of display, which is display table. And I don't really, really like it, but we can. And this allows you to specify tables not using the tag table. Instead of table, you can use a div with a class of table. And the class table can be specified, uh, class table, oops, class table, is specified as display of table. And then instead of a TR, you can have a div with a class of, uh, I don't know, table row. This is what we, something that we want to define ourselves, or T row, if I like it to be more concise, uh, T row. And we can define that a, an element with a class of T row it will have a display of table row, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We've got table cell, table column, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what this does is to not force the HTML document to deal with tables, but you can have generic divs and decide on the CSS side if they have to behave as tables and tables rows or something else. Um, I'm not necessarily recommending it. Oh, also, there's a warning here. Be careful when using these values. Older browsers struggle with them and getting carried away with CSS tables can seriously damage your accessibility. HTML should be used to convey meaning. So if you have a tabular data, it should be arranged probably in HTML tables. Using CSS tables exclusively could result in a mash of data that is completely unreadable without the CSS. Bad, and not in a Michael Jackson way. Okay, uh, I, I love... HTML doc. I don't know if you if you noticed it, but we moved from Ryan's tutorials to HTML doc, which is another website with free tutorials on these more advanced concepts. That's also why I'm repeating some of the concepts because uh, there's an overlap between the concepts that are described in Ryan's tutorials and those who are described in HTML doc. But still, 
Um, very good website, very well done, and I love the the fact that it's a, a very pleasant read after all, uh, plenty of jokes. So no, uh, the bottom line: don't use class table if you if you don't really know what you're doing. Just stick with tables, and that's fine because tables will always work even if CSS is not loaded, even if the browser doesn't understand some CSS rules. Well, using a using these rules adds nothing to our case okay so pseudo elements we know them already that's it page layout okay so there are some uh, cool things that we can do to place things inside of our page most of them are now outdated actually but let's see we've got a position property and every element in the page has by default a position property which is static. Static is the default value and renders the boxes in normal ordering of things as they appear in the HTML. But we also have relative positioning, absolute positioning and even fixed positioning. And this is really, really important. So what if I take again some of my code here? Where is that? What if I take the, um, my, I don't know, me too, no spacing at all, okay? I have this P and I say that the position of this P is absolute. You see that it moved a little bit. It did move a little bit. Uh, it didn't move as I thought, but it did move. Uh, probably because we have some um, other strange code happening here, no? I don't know why it moved there. You know what? Let's try a fresh positioning HTML. Positioning HTML. I would like to start again with a fresh thing. So we've got the body. Uh, if I need some style, I will probably put it in here because it's more convenient in my specific case. And um, I will have some div that will contain something so you know what i'm going to start coloring things up so uh, i will call this my header and i will say that my header has a specific height for now so i can see it uh, my height will be 100 pixels and it will have a background color of uh yeah why not light green Let's see what happens. I'm going to positioning. Okay, this is my current situation. I've got a body and inside of the body I've got a div which I called header for some reason. And now I'm going to create another div here with a class of uh, main. I'm not using semantic tags. I could, but I'm not doing it. And here in my style, uh -huh, uh -huh. <clears throat> I'm using a height of, uh, I don't know, 200 pixels. I don't like this to be so so big. Let's say 50. <clears throat> and here I'm putting a background color of my favorites here, cornflower blue. Okay, these two divs are one above the other, of course. But now, if my main has a position of absolute, it completely disappeared. What? Well, position absolute must also specify where I want to place this thing. For example, I want to say that starting from the top, I want it to be at 50%. And starting from left, I want it to be too at 50%. Is it going to show now? Nope. Because probably what is happening? Oh, because I also need to specify a width apparently. This uh, this is a very important thing that I'm showing you here. Uh, there's no good or bad way to write CSS. And the rules that you write are as easy to understand as difficult to use. Because some rules require that you add other rules that are not even specified in the documentation. So you have to... Uh, really understand, inspect what is happening 
and try to make sense of what's happening, maybe even Google a little bit, and then build some experience. For example, the recipe about margin zero auto is something that I came up with as soon as I needed it. And there's n the, the, the documentation about margin that we saw so far didn't even mention margin zero auto. That was a recipe that I found out by, while working. Here, I see that the div main, as soon as I put position absolute, is telling me that the bounds of, the dis of this div are zero times 200. You can see it here on the tooltip that shows zero per 200. And I think it shows even here below, zero per 200. So the reason why the main is not showing is that for some reason, position absolute is triggering the fact that the div is not spanning the whole container, but it's shrinking to zero. The width is shrinking to zero. And well, to make sense of this, I would say that when position is absolute, this main thing has no container anymore. So that's why uh, when it, there's no container, the div doesn't know how much to span. So I would say that the width is um, 300 pixels. And probably now something will show. Yeah, it shows. So as you can see, this div is placed, it seems like it's placed below, right below, and this was not my intention. So let's try to do something else. Um, oh no, because I completely removed any, any style that I had here. So let's do, a, uh, let's do a position absolute again. And the position is currently absolute, but I'm not telling it where it should be positioned. So if I say top zero, for example, you see that this main is now on the top of the document, even overlapping on the header. It's uh, hiding the header uh, below it. And I can see it if I say that from the left instead it's 50%. You can see now that this element is positioned, well, in this case, in 50% of the width of the document and on the top, thus partially. Uh, overlapping on the header element. So this is a cool way you can position things absolutely in the page. And I must confess, it was my first thought as soon as I wanted to place this, uh, th th this um, image absolutely in the page. I could say, position this image absolutely. Uh, the top will be, I don't know, 50 pixels. The left will be 50 pixels. And you can place it exactly where it is right now. The problem with this kind of uh, positioning, let me see, top 50 pixels and right 50 pixels. So as you can see, I positioned this div containing an image absolutely. Now the top, it's, uh, it has a spacing of 50 pixels on the top and on the right, and it's positioned completely absolutely. The problem is that is, is twofold. First of all, when you position absolutely, you overlap other things. In fact, here I've got some text that is now hidden by the image itself. And another problem that I have is that this is not really responsive because it looks good until I go here. Um, picture this as a mobile screen. But if the mobile screen was even smaller, Ah, uh, that's not really good. Well, the fact that this is becoming shorter is due to some other rule that I created. So just to ignore that. So as you can see, it's not even centered anymore. And I don't like position absolute. I must find some uh, other way to position this thing as I wish without breaking uh, the text, without overlapping the text, and without... Um, and without ruining my responsiveness, the responsiveness of my website. Angelo says, how long did it roughly take you to create the LE page? Just wondering how much time someone experienced needs for creating a proper website. Um, this is, curiously enough, I didn't create the page myself at first. I asked a couple of uh, juniors to do this website and they tried applying some of the concepts that I explained them uh, during my courses. So they tried with the position absolute, they tried using even Bootstrap as a framework, they tried multiple things and they, come up, they came up with uh, some ideas. And then we had some sort of um, code review session 
in which I showed them that there was a better or simpler way to do some of the things that they did. So we refactored, as we say, we refactored the code, which means modifying the code so it behaves pretty much the same, but it's written in a, in a better way, in a more readable way, in a more flexible way. And at the end, we came up with this kind of, uh, of structure and style. So, but in my case, it was pretty easy to do this code review. So as soon as you've got the experience on some of the rules that I'm going to tell you, uh, it will take you really just, I don't know, half an hour, one hour to do this, if you're really experienced and you're a fast typer. Uh, if you're not, you can take one day, two days, even a week. Uh, nobody is, uh, is waiting for you right now. So a good exercise that you can do, in fact, is to look at some website that you like, even this one, of course, and try to recreate it with the, um, uh, with the knowledge that you have so far. And uh, the more you learn, the more you try to apply other rules and other, uh, and other recipes and other rules of thumb that will allow you to create a better code. Um, yeah, I can even show you. Let me see. So this is the code of the website that you saw. And if I look at the commits, there's 53 commits. And before the commits that I did, there were other commits made by other people, some of my former students. So, for example, I could go, well, let's see this commit here. I'm going to browse the files. Yep. So, this is the code that this friend of mine, Hamza, uh, created for this website. So, you can see that there's, uh, no, th no, this is already too new, <laughs> sorry. I have to go back in time. These are all the commits that we did together. So let's oh, refactor after code review. You see, this is my commit after the code review. And so this is the commit before the, the commit review, uh, the, the, the code review. So as you will see here, the new index that he was creating was a good new index with a lot of commented code with some divs and some uh, H5, some of the divs. You can see some IDs and some classes. You see the form that we created together with the first name, last name, email, submit button. Um, he created this fourth section div, main container, first row, a list of members, each member being a div with an image, a, P, a paragraph, and an H5. Nothing really new uh, from what you already know. Uh, but I think that this structure was too deep. Maybe we could have come up with a simpler structure, with a more uh, reasonable structure. So if you see the new version of the code, I, I don't know if uh, it, it shows as better looking, probably not. But for example, we were seeing the members and I have a section called members container with each member being an image, a title of H3 and a paragraph. And all these were inside of a not really nested structure. This is a shallow structure. Well, this is a much more nested structure, which makes styling more difficult, actually. So this is the difference between reasonable, uh, well, appreciable code. This is good code already. But this is probably better code because it's, uh, it's good looking not only as a result, but it's good looking also from a code point of view. And uh, it's simpler. As Antoine de Saint-Exupéry said um, about perfection, I'm sorry, I don't want to, to quote it by myself. Perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. And this is what I was trying to do during my code review. I tried to remove as much as I could until there was nothing that I could remove anymore. So as soon as I reach this moment, I'm so satisfied. I see this code and I say, wow, I cannot remove anything more than that. This is 
close to perfection. Then I will see this code in three months, six months, or someone more experienced than me will see this code and will say, no, this is crap, you could have removed even more. Okay, there's still room to improve. Awesome, even better. But my, the, the main satisfaction that I have when I do code is not just to write code that works, but to write code that is as perfect as possible when there's nothing left to take away. And this is what I think makes coding a craft, in, or at least in my experience. Bobby says, there are, those are pretty much the free code calm tasks after you complete the HTML and CSS lessons. You are given a website and have to recreate it. Oh, okay, I didn't know about that. Or you can create your own website, as Tiago and Sao are doing, or you were doing too, guys. Uh, just as soon as you, f as you um, learn some uh, new tags and new rules and uh, new ways of doing things, you can try to apply them to your website and maybe even copy from uh, other people. Uh, I don't know, if you want to copy the layout of this slide, you can see that there's a green header, uh, violet, I don't know, lila uh, footer with a link and uh, here's the logo, here we have a title, but it's on the right. Here we've got an image that spanned half of the, uh, of, the, of the slide. And then we've got an unordered list here. And all of this is made with HTML and CSS because I'm showing you these slides from a web browser. So all of this, I didn't do them myself. I'm using Google Slides as an application, but this is a web application that is using HTML and CSS to show the slides as you are seeing. Even transitions, animations of any source. I don't do many transitions, but I think that there is a transition between slides. Well, there's this one and also this one. This transition was performed by mixing a little bit of HTML, CSS, and also some JavaScript. So you can do a lot of things. So we're talking about positioning things. You can position things absolutely. But if you position things absolutely, they could possibly overlap other elements. And also, uh, sometimes you don't want to position something absolutely in the document. Maybe you want to position something absolutely inside of its own container. That's the reason, main reason why we also have a position of relative. In fact, let's see if I can show it in here. If this has a position, I don't know if I can show it. Um, let's put this guy inside of another container. For example, here. Okay, we've got this, this thing here. So this image has now a position absolute, a top zero, and a left zero. So of course, this element is at the top of the document, but I wanted it to be positioned absolutely in respect to this div, to this container, not to the whole document. That's why I also need to put on the document, on, on, on the container div, a uh, position relative. If I put this, then this element, this element of class right, will be positioned absolutely not respect to the whole document, but to the parent that has a position relative. Well, actually to the ancestor, any parent, grandfather, grand grandparent, etc. But still, you need to have to add this position relative to any container element that wants to trigger the relative absoluteness of this positioning here. I, I don't know if, uh, if it was clear. So I can place this 50% and maybe 50 pixel and now it's almost centered inside of here, but not inside of the document. As soon as I remove position relative, then this element will be positioned absolutely 50 pixels on the top left 50%, but respect to the whole document, not to the element that it's containing it. Okay, we also have got this uh, fixed uh, positioning, which is awesome, especially if you want to create headers. For example, my website, ingloriouscoders.it, I think it has this header, which is position fixed. And what does it mean? Let's uh, go to a website that has, to a page that has, um, that is, that should be scrolled. As you can see, this is, will not be placed absolutely. It will be fixed in the page. And then at a certain point, it will also start scrolling up. 
So this is perfect for headers, especially if you want to keep this navigation menu while you are scrolling. And then, I don't know why actually, I don't remember why, but at a certain point this uh, position fix decides that there's no need to see that heading, that header anymore, so it just hides it at a certain point. But this is what position fix makes. If I instead replace position fixed with a position uh, absolute, let's see if I can find it. Uh, this is the toolbar, this is the header, and as you can see the position was, no, where is that? I think it should be here. Uh, background attachment fixed, but it's another thing. Ah, where is position fixed? Maybe here? No, it should not be here. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, we've got a display of grid. Oh, come on, where's position fixed? I'm gonna, I'm gonna look for it. Position fixed. Oh, I don't even have a position fixed apparently. So, Nope, I got it completely wrong, probably. I really thought that this was a position fixed. Oh, no, this is a position sticky, I'm sorry. This is a position sticky and... I'm sorry, I mixed them up. Position sticky is what makes this uh, a good header. In fact, if I put position absolute, and I write it correctly, position absolute is positioning this element absolutely on top zero. And it even changed the size of the header because as i told you already the the every div is every display block is trying to span the whole width of its containing element but when i when you have a position absolute that is not contain contained inside of a position relative then there's no container anymore this is just relative to the whole document so probably i can just change it like this not even i have to put um, a width so this header is also with with 100%. Will this work? Yeah. Now the width is 100%. And as you can see, position absolute makes the header being completely fixed there and it scrolls along with the page. Also another bad thing is that it's probably yeah, overlapping on the following element, the main element. So this is completely nonsense. I don't want it to be like this. There's also a position fixed, which I must confess, I don't even remember what the difference is. So let's see if it's here. Absolute pulls a box out of the normal flow of the HTML and delivers it to a world all of its own. In this crazy little world, the absolute box can be placed anywhere on the page using top right, bottom and left. Fixed behaves like absolute, but it will absolutely position a box in reference to the browser window as opposed to the web page. So fixed boxes should stay exactly where they are on the screen, even when the page is scrolled. Is this true? If I scroll this page now with position fixed, you will see that the whole page scrolls, but not this header. So this header is now completely fixed, not on the page, but on the browser, on the, on the tab, on the document. So this is really fixed. But one thing that we like even better is the position sticky when dealing with headers, because sticky will stick, but not too much. Let's say like this. And also sticky is not overlapping anything. Sticky is really cool because it's not overlapping on the main. Uh, it's leaving room for, for the subsequent elements. But then as soon as you scroll, these elements can scroll down below this thing. I'm closing this tab because it's starting to make my browser suffer. Uh, but I, I think and I hope you, you understood the gist of this. So we've got many kinds of positions and we also have another kind of uh, positioning style which is floating. Floating can be used to float elements on the left, on the right and that's it. You cannot float things on the center, you can just float them on the left or on the right. And I saw this thing uh, used especially for images. So for example, if you have a long paragraph with text and you want to put an image uh, in between the paragraph. This is quite tricky. Uh, so I think I'm going to show you a couple of things. But I have to go back to some... Let me say that... 
I don't know. Let's okay. Let's put a let's put a picture here, uh, but it's not a real picture, so it will be a div. Div of class picture. Um, and the picture will have a fixed width of 50 pixels and a height of 50 pixels. And we'll have a background so we can see it. Let's make it pink. And then inside of this uh, div, we also have some text. So let's copy some lorem ipsum so we're able to see the some text. Let's copy this thing, even though if it's not a lorem ipsum. But it's still some text. So what do we have here right now? Okay, we've got some things, but also I would like to remove other things that we have here. No, hide with, no, that's fine. Okay, so as you can see, we've got an image here, a div. But since it's, it's a div, it has a display of block. So even though the picture is small, the div is still trying to span the whole width of the parent element and putting the text below it. But if I say that the picture has a float of left, you can see that now the picture is somehow floating on the left, leaving room for the text to wrap it around. And the same goes with float right. I can make it float right, so the text is now wrapping it around and the image is floating there. And um, the text will, will pretty easily adapt. So let's remove, let's remove some, uh, I have to put some height here. No, I, I'm not putting height because now we have some content in the main. So we've got, a, okay, we've got a header which has a fixed width. We've got a, another div which is the main, which spans the whole height of the document, which is already bi pretty big. We've got a picture which is not floating, but if I make it float, it floats gracefully and it's also quite responsive because the text will adapt automatically. I think that you know this kind of behavior from, uh, I don't know, Word documents, right? You can float pictures around in, flow in Word documents. And the same goes with float right. Now, it's floating pretty good. And the cool thing about this, uh, compared especially to position absolute, is that as you can see, the text is not being overlapped by the image. This is the really important part. If I used position absolute here, and uh, top zero, right zero, this is not where it's supposed to be. I ha if I want it to be here on the right corner of the main, I also need to say that the main should have a position relative. Remember, the parent should have a position relative. But this is not what I want, because as you can see, the, the text is being overlapped by the image. So position absolute in this case, in this particular case, is not really a good choice to put images absolutely in the document. While floating is probably a better alternative. Because now the text is not being overlapped, it will adapt to whatever happens. You can have things floating on the left and also floating on the right, but you will see, if you experiment with it, you will see that it's pretty, pretty complicated to make things that have some sense. In fact, floating left and right was the only means that we had in early times to position things in a grid-like uh, fashion. And we didn't want to use display table. We didn't want to use tables to lay out things in a grid. So we resorted to use CSS frameworks such as Bootstrap, which are predefined sets of CSS rules that you can apply to your elements by adding some classes, some predefined classes that are uh, given to you by Bootstrap. And especially, Bootstrap was really, really important for the grid system. What is a grid system? Well, the grid system, if I can find it here, is this. You can write some uh, divs with special classes provided by Bootstrap. So, for example, div with a class of container, and a div with a class of row, and a div with a class of column small, and we have three columns small, and Bootstrap will automatically 
create something like this. We have three divs, but they are in a three columns grid instead of being one after one below the other. And this was achieved by triggering and tweaking a little bit of float left, float right, and other strange stuff. It was a hack. It was a real hack on the browser that allowed to, 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 to lay out items in a grid-like fashion. Nowadays, we can get rid of this because nowadays we've got even two important things which are called Flexbox and CSS Grid, which allow us to place things in a grid-like fashion without having to hack our code with the float lefts and float right. So I'm telling you the history of this, but you don't need to know this. Just use float left or float right as I showed you, just to place images or other things floating around your, mainly your text, on the left or on the right. You cannot even float them on the center. And um, then there's also a clear both, which is pretty important, but I don't know if I can show this uh, easily to you. Let's see. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Let's see if there's a dot. Here it is. Let's close the, let's close a paragraph here. Wait a second. I'm going to close the paragraph here and I'm going to reopen the paragraph here. This was a paragraph, right? No, it was not. Ah, it's so difficult to see all this text by scrolling. You remember what I told you. It's, it's not really good to have text that is spanning such a long, long number of characters. But still, now I think that I created something that has two paragraphs. One is this one, and the other one is here. So I split the text into two paragraphs. The picture is not floating because I didn't finalize it, but I can make it float right. And now the picture is floating. But what I wanted to show you is not even this. Uh, so let me see if I can f if I can create what I wanted to create. Um, let's close the paragraph here and let's reopen it. Now we've got three paragraphs, and now we're we're getting around somewhere. But it's still not enough. I'm going to create a picture which is a little wider, 80 by 80. Okay, okay. So you can see that this picture is floating. So the two paragraphs here are adapting to this picture. In fact, this paragraph is going on a new line in order to make room to the picture. And also this paragraph is making room with a new line in here. But what if I want to say, no, just this paragraph should uh, adapt to the floating image and this paragraph should not adapt, should just go below the image and start doing its business on the whole uh, width of the uh, of the of the of the document. So, what we can do is to add a new property to this paragraph, and usually this property is uh, shaped with a class that is called clear fix. I usually I've usually seen this name, but it's just a convention. And if I put a class of clear fix, I can use these other properties, which I think is called clear both. Yeah, it worked. So, as you can see, the first paragraph is still adapting uh, to the floating picture, but the second paragraph decided to clear both, which means it doesn't want to adapt to the picture, so it will just go a little below and span the whole width. This is how you break the rule of uh, adapting to the picture for every single paragraph. This paragraph doesn't want to adapt, so it will clear the floating uh, property and start spanning the whole width of the document. And this is what we have here. I hope I'm not going too fast for you. If there's any doubt about this, please tell me. Uh, I started even mentioning Bootstrap. Don't worry, we'll get to Bootstrap in a while. Um, I'm starting to give you some hints and then we'll go deeper on, on some of the concepts. Remember that at the end of each slide, you have some 
thing to do, some practice time. So you can read the reference material that is always linked in every slide. You can apply some of the styling to your website. As soon as you learn something, you can try to apply it to your website. You can do some related exercises about CSS or free code camp, which is completely free and uh, very interactive, very easy to use. And now, as I promised, I'm going really, really fast and we're going ahead of time. This is a slider that I should have done next week. But if you're okay with that, I can start right away. We're going really, really fast on CSS, but you will see that we are going to go really, really slow on the first slide about JavaScript because that's a lot more difficult and we have to spend much more time on that. So... Let's go. CSS, advanced concepts. Not really advanced. Most of them are pretty stupid. For example, you already know about border radius because I already mentioned it. Let's see what border radius is about. You can cre achieve rounded corners. So uh, you can use border radius, 20 pixels, and this will make every corner of your element rounded with a radius of 20 pixels. Or, um, of course, if you do want a border, you can also type border and then border radius, and that's fine. You, uh, this is exactly the same thing that you can specify with uh, padding, margin, border. So you can specify four different values, for example, and you will see that this guy has four different roundings of the same border. Curvy. Um, we can also have... Ellipsis, and this is something that I never done before, but if you do border radius 50 pixels slash 100 pixels, it seems like you can define two different kinds of, uh, of radiuses, thus creating some sort of egg, if you really need an egg. And that's it. Uh, we don't even need to try it. You can try it by yourself. I think it's much, much better if you start creating your own border radius. This is the last thing uh, that I'm doing it. Let's round this image. I'm going to say border radius of 30 pixels. And now we've got uh, an, an, a rounded cornered image. Maybe 30 pixels is too much. Let's do 20. I like it better. And you will see that border radius actually triggered four different properties. Border top left, border top right, border bottom right, border bottom left radius but you can trigger them independently if you wish so. For example, let's say border bottom left radius is 20 pixels. And that's it. I want the border to be um, rounded only here. Because, because, yeah, because. Okay, so this is border radius. And this is how you do rounded corners. Box shadows. You want to add some cool shadows to your documents, uh, to your elements, why not? Box shadow is pretty tricky to use. So, as always, box shadow online. Box shadow generator, but this connection is not private. You should renew your SSL certificate. So let's go here. Okay, so the box shadow is this cool no thanks. Mm, this cool shadow that you see here, which as you can see is a grayish shadow and it dims the more you go f further um, away from this, uh, f from this rectangle. And this shadow is cast uh, from the, well, top left. So you can see the shadow on the bottom right. Well, here you can trigger all these properties. So you can have a shadow within a different angle. So for example, here with the sun on the zenith, or you can have a shadow on top, or just anywhere you want. You just trigger the degrees of this shadow. You can have a more distance or less distance, which makes the box probably closer or far from you. And I would say 15 pixels is fine for now. And we can have a degree of blur. So the shadow could be more blurry or it can be more sharp. Okay. This triggers, of course, the RGB values of the color. So you can have an, even a blue shadow or a red shadow. And you can have some sort of opacity of the shadow. So this is the alpha of the RGB color. 
Given this, you have some generated code, which is this. Box shadow, 11 pixels, 10 pixels, 8 pixels, 0 pixels, RGBA. And I don't really care about the values of these pixels. You can find them by yourselves. Uh, you can take this box shadow, you can add it to your, um, to your image element if you want, like this. And you will see that now the picture looks uh, away from the rest of the document. And you can trigger all the different elements. Here, the developer tools are not doing a great job in telling you what the different uh, values mean. But this is probably because it's really no use. You just use a CSS3 box shadow and you trigger things around here and you just copy paste the code. But I copied just one line. What are these two other lines here? Well, some browsers uh, started integrating the box shadow property, but um, while the standard was still being defined and approved. So, as you can see, these are box shadows which, be, which have uh, exactly the same value as this generic box shadow, but this has a prefix of dash webkit, and this has a prefix of dash moz, which kind of uh, reminds of Mozilla. So, this is a property that will have value for Mozilla browsers, which is just one, Firefox, as far as I know. And this will work for WebKit-based browsers, which we can say nowadays that it's uh, Chromium-based browsers. Well, this is, is for uh, Chrome, for Safari, for Edge right now, and for every major browser, even Opera right now. But... Um, in, a few years ago, different browsers used different rendering engines and behaved slightly differently. So you had to create a different rule for each different browser. And since it's really, really uh, boring to write all these kind of rules, we used to have some tools that allow you to just write one rule and then those tools will automatically add the remaining rules by themselves. So there are some tools that allow us to do many things automatically and nowadays it's not really that important anymore. Uh, browsers are starting to be more and more standard because they are using almost all of them one um, one rendering engine, which is the Chromium rendering engine. So we just need mostly to write Box Shadow, mostly. Okay, so this is Box Shadow, but we also have Inner Shadow. If you add Inset to your Box Shadow, you will see that the shadow is inside of the element, not outside of it. And there are some... Um, yeah, the properties are almost the same, and I think that this is not allowing you to use Inner Shadow. That's a pity. Oh, optional setting. Yeah, inset. So as you can see now, we've got the inset. And also got this spread, which apparently is triggering this other property here. And, you know, this is more of a qualitative thing. You, you fiddle around with your shadow, and then you find the shadow that you like, and then you copy it, and you use it. Or you can use some CSS framework that adds these shadows. For example, material CSS shadows. Let me see if there are some uh, material design box shadows. This guy created this piece of CSS that you can just copy. And you can see that he created uh, he or she, I don't know, this guy, oh, Samuel, it's a he probably. Uh, so he created multiple divs with uh, each one having a class of card. So all of these divs are cards, but some of these divs have another class also, which is card one, card two, card three, card four, card five, which apparently trigger how much shadow you want to cast upon all these cards. So if you look at the CSS that this guy created, he created every card having a background of white, a uh, border radius of two pixels, which is uh, almost, uh, I, I, can, I, I, I hardly can see it, but there is some, uh, some border radius here. It's not completely sharp. They have a display of inline block, which I didn't tell you, but inline block is a mixture of inline and block, because 
as blocks, they, uh, let me say, inline versus inline block. I already did this research before doing this course. Compared to display inline, the major difference is that display inline block allows to set a width and a height on the element, while display inline is just used for text and it just adapts to the size of its contents. But inline block instead allows you to place things in line, so one next to the other, but also specify a width and a height. And this is what's happening here. In fact, every one of these cards have a width and a height specified as 300 pixels. We also have a margin with the special uh, measure unit that I didn't tell you already. We've got a position relative to, which I don't know why is there. But still, the most important part is that card one wants to cast a very small shadow and you can see that box shadow is 0, 1 pixel, 3 pixels, RGBA, blah, blah, comma, 0, 1 pixel, 2 pixel, blah, blah, blah. Why is this comma? Why do we have different box shadows values in the same line? This is what I'm going to show you in a while. You can add multiple box shadows, apparently. And we also have got a transition, which I didn't explain yet, which allows you to make some smart, sort of uh, very small animations. And now we've got a card one hover, that you know what this is. This is a pseudo element. So this is the card one as soon as I hover on it, which adds a different box shadow with different values. What is the meaning of this? Well, this is the card one, and if I hover on it, the shadow is, well, stronger as soon as I hover on it, yeah, right? And this is the same that goes with card two. Card two has a deeper shadow, but probably, nope, nothing happens when I hover on it. Only the card one will hover, will, will drop a, a, a stronger shadow when I hover on it. And you know what? I'm pretty sure that I blatantly copied and pasted this code in my own website or probably I yeah borrowed a little bit of it in fact all my code is made with shadows and if I hover on them it's it doesn't show too much but these shadows are have actually uh, a darker sh yeah these cards have a darker shadow so I probably copied from that code I stole uh, but it's all for free and it was provided for free by Samuel. So thanks a lot Samuel for giving us this code. So as you can see lots of our coding experience could also be just looking around seeing something that I, we like inspecting how it works and then stealing from them and this is probably what I did here. I stole. Let me see. This is a shot. Look at that. I even copied exactly the same names, card, card one, and card one has this box shadow, and it even has the same transition, the cubic bezier that I haven't explained yet. So yeah, I completely copied from that code, from that same code that I'm showing you. And uh, yeah, Bobby says, yay, I finally see bezier curves, but uh, we don't see the effect of bezier curves right now, so we're going to tell them a little more in detail. So you can create box shadows that cast a shadow behind the element, you can cast shadows inside of the element, and you can even have text shadows. Uh, text shadow will allow you to create cool shadow effects. Let's see if we can see some examples. Here it is, an ugly text shadow on this text a red text shadow of two pixels, two pixels, color red. This is really, really ugly. Let's see if we can see some other cool text shadow examples. This is exactly the same, I think. Oh, no, this has also some eight pixels of blur effect. And uh, what is this? Oh, this is nice. This is white text, but the text shadow in black allows you to see the text, even on, the back on a white background. Most of the times I use uh, text shadow to make the text more visible um, in front of some uh, hard background. For example, for example, nothing. I didn't put any text shadow in here, but I could. So a remote care app for those living with dementia is not really visible here. 
Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but I cannot really see it very much. So a way to make this more visible could be either to make the color darker, of course. Uh, this is making the color, well, let's put the color real dark, black. Okay, now it's more visible. Or I could try to cast a text shadow. And if I remember correctly, I have to put at least three numbers. <laughs> I don't remember which numbers are. Five pixels, five pixels, black. This is really ugly. Let's put another five pixel. And this five pixel, as you can see, is adding some blur. Uh, I can have zero pixels here and zero pixels here. And now you can see that the shadow is cast from the center of each letter. And uh, it's not really nice to see, but at least it makes the text a little more visible. Maybe I can tweak a little bit the, the values here. No, this is kind of blurry. I don't like it. But still, anyway, we can see the text shadow being generated online with some tool. Here it is, some cool text shadow examples. You want the looks shadow, the smooth shadow, the inset shadow too. This is pretty cool, especially if you're a nerd like me. You can have the ghost shadow, the Dracula shadow, and all of these shadows are just rules that you can tweak here with the shift right, shift down, blur, opacity, and of course color. And this is the resulting code that you can just copy and paste in your code base. Okay, so nothing to create yourself with uh, numeric values, just copy from online tools that you find. And uh, apart from shadows, we have some advanced selectors. These are pretty important. These are more advanced concepts, of course. Everything good so far? I hear you very silent but probably because you're really, really interested in, in, in these topics. If you find them boring, really, don't worry. Things will get much less boring later on. This can be pretty basic, trivial stuff, but as soon as we go with JavaScript, there be dragons, true. So we've got universal selectors. You can use something that looks a little bit like the uh, we saw this kind of wild cards using the command line before. We can say that every single element should have a margin of zero and a padding of zero. This, of course, is very invasive. Every element that you have will completely wipe out the margin and the padding, unless you specify something, uh, something else. So you can say, yeah, everything... Oops, not here. Everything will have a margin of zero, except for paragraphs, which will have a margin bottom. Oh, come on, of uh, five pixels. Okay, so you can say generically everything will have a margin zero, but paragraphs will have a margin bottom of five pixels, and a paragraph that is a special one will also have a margin top of five pixels and maybe can override the margin bottom by saying that in this case it's 10 pixels you can do whatever you want okay um, in this case they're saying that inside of an element with an id of contact everything should have a display of blocks of block so this not does not mean just everything everything given the right context We've got child selectors, and here we can do some reasoning about performance. There's the greater than symbol that we can use, which achieves a little more performance. In fact, if you say ID genus examples greater than li, we are applying these rules only to the direct children of this element with this ID. And this can give you some, info in, some important performance boost, because as soon as you were, as the browser ran over through the direct descendants of genus examples, it will not try to apply these rules further down the hierarchy. And this is exactly what is being explained here. You've got a UL with an ID, and the UL has some LIs, two LIs, cats and apes. But 
These LIs contain another unordered list with other list items inside. So if you write genus examples greater than symbol LI, there will be some border applied, but the border will be applied only to direct descendants of this UL. So only to this LI and to this LI. These LIs here are not direct descendants of UL, so this rule will not be applied to them. If instead you remove this greater than symbol and you say just uh, ID genus example space LI, then every single descendant of this UL will have these rules applied. So also these ones. Let's see if it shows the example. No, it doesn't, but I can just copy and paste because I'm starting to become lazy. So in positioning, well, this is not really positioning. I'm putting this UL here and I'm putting this CSS here on top on the style part. I know I'm going really fast. I'm sorry. Uh, I hope that you are not you don't your your head is not spinning for this. So we've got the UL with the ID genus examples and inside of this UL we see only the direct descendants having this rule being applied. And instead those LIs which are not direct descendants do not have this rule applied. If I want the rule to be applied to every LI in every level of this hierarchy, then I can get rid of this greater than symbol. And now every LI in the hierarchy will be affected by this rule. So direct descendants allows you to limit the number of elements to which you are applying some rule. And they also give you a small performance boost in the sense that uh, as soon as the children, direct children of UL have been styled with those rules, the browser will probably not go deeper nesting inside of the L other LIs because this rule will not be applied to them. We've got also the adjacent selector, which is the plus. These are new uh, elements of the CSS syntax, which were not available for a long time. These are pieces of syntax from CSS3. H1 plus P allows you to style something that is right next. Uh, it's a sibling uh, immediately after the H1. And um, let's see some other examples of this. Maybe maybe some interactive, because I think that W3School uh, is, is really making it in, easy to understand, easy to grasp. So div space p means any p that is a descendant of the div. Here we've got some HTML which have, has an h2, the descendant selector, a paragraph. We've got a div which contains two paragraphs and also one section containing a paragraph. This is not formatted well, but I can format it better and you will see that this paragraph is inside of a section like this. Then we've got other paragraphs here and we've got a style that says any P that is a descendant of div should have a background of yellow. So of course this paragraph is yellow because it's a descendant of a div. This paragraph is yellow because it's a descendant of the div. And also this one because it's not a direct descendant of the div, but it is a descendant of the div. But if I put div greater than p and I run the code, you will see that the third paragraph is not affected by this rule anymore because the paragraph is a descendant of div, but not a direct one anymore. Um, child selector is what we saw right now. This is exactly the same example that I showed. So we've got a div descendant p. The div has two descendants which are direct, these two p's, in fact they are yellow. This descendant is not direct. As you can see it's not a child but it's a descendant but it's not affected by this rule. And then we've got another paragraph which is a direct descendant, it's a child. So this becomes yellow. These are the paragraphs instead are not children of any div. So of course they will not be yellow. 
And uh, then we've got the adjacent sibling selector. And I have to show this to you because it looks easy, but there's a gotcha. Uh, here we've got div plus p, which means any p that is next to a div, not inside of a div, but next to it. So here we've got a p, and this is not next to a div, so it's not yellow. Here we've got two p's which are inside of a div, but not next to a div, so they are both not yellow. This is a paragraph which is right next to a div, so this will be yellow. But this is another paragraph which is not close to a div, it's close to a paragraph, so this is not yellow. So this is allowing you to select only the p that is adjacent to the element that you specified here on the left. And only on the right of it, only after, we've got a p which is next to the div, but it's before the div, and this is not affected. So what if you want to make this one yellow? You can, not, you can just not use this adjacent sibling selector. You just cannot. You have to use some, some other trick. For example, add a class or uh, whatever. You, can, you say before and you put the any P that has a class of before will have a background color of yellow. And in that case, it works. And we also have a general sibling selector, which is performed with a tilde, which is achieved with a tilde. This is exactly the same example as before, but here we've got a tilde. So we've got H2, which is not affected, of course. This paragraph is not uh, next to a div, so it's not yellow. This other paragraph is not next to a div. At least, it's on the left of a div, but not on the right, so this is not affected. Then there's a div with a paragraph inside, and this paragraph is not next to a div. It's inside of it, so it's not yellow. Then we've got this third paragraph, which is strictly close to this div, right uh, after the div, so this will be yellow. Then we've got some code, which is not a paragraph, so it's not yellow. And then we've got another paragraph, which is at the same level of the div, and it's after the div. So with this tilde, general sibling selector, this paragraph will actually be affected by the rule. So the difference between the tilde and the plus is that any paragraph in here, which is after the div, even if there's something in between, will be affected by the rule. Whereas with a plus, only the direct sibling of a div will be affected. Which means that, let's try again, if I put some code in here, this paragraph is not yellow anymore because it's not a, an adjacent sibling. It's not adjacent to the div, there's something in between. But with the tilde, this is just a generic sibling. So both paragraphs which are stated after the div will actually be uh, ha have this rule applied. So these are st pretty strange rules because they are, they, they, they are applied only on specific cases, usually on elements which are on the right. You cannot specify a rule for the elements which are specified above uh, the div, before the div. And also, there's no special rule that allows you to apply some rules to the parent of something. So if you have a paragraph and you want to say the parent of this paragraph, which is the div, should behave like this, there's no such um, selector that allows you to specify the parent of an element. Only children, direct children, only descendants, or only siblings, but only those who are defined after, not before. So don't rely too much on these selectors. It's much better probably to use classes and IDs. These are fail-safe. Okay, so, so many tabs open. <laughs> Gonna close most of them. And let's go back to what we have. Um, we finished this, right? Yeah, so I'm gonna close it. And uh, these are these uh, selectors that we saw so far. So everything or direct descendants, which is children, um, adjacent siblings, general siblings. 
Would you like to add transparency to your colors? We already know that there's an alpha property that we can add to our RGB or HSL uh, colors. So I'm not going in detail on this. Uh, we already know this. Um, we've got at rules in CSS and we already saw the first one, at import. At import is a rule that allowed us to import some other CSS from within our CSS. At import is importing a CSS locally or even from the web. It downloads the CSS from the web and it incorporates in this CSS. So this is one kind of at rule because it starts with an at symbol. And we also got the media uh, rule, which is important for media queries. And media queries, we will see them, are important to make our websites responsive. So with media, you're able to target different medias. For example, media print applies the rules to printers and not to the computer screen. Or media screen and projection is probably used for your computer screen, but also your projector. I never saw projection before. I usually use just media screen. Um, we can also use another at rule, which is font face. And this is what will allow you to add new fonts on the browser, if you, if, even if you don't have them yet. And I use this thing heavily on my websites in Glorious Coders because this font here is called ethnocentric. And you don't have this font installed on your computer probably. So it was uh, downloaded from, uh, I think, Google Fonts. I went here and I looked for some cool fonts that I wanted and I stumbled upon ethnocentric. Here it is. So available from these external foundries. Okay, font. Okay, I found this. Yeah. And I can buy this font, but actually I also found a free version of it. So I didn't steal it. I used the free version. And as you can see, the usual sentence that is used to showcase the font, to give you an example of the font, is the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. You cannot see the whole text, but it's, it's there. And it's a popular sentence because it uh, shows every single letter of the English alphabet. So this is why we use this sentence, which is also cute. And I had to add it as a picture here. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dogs. Uh, of the lazy dog. Okay, so we can use this um, other at rule called font face in which we can define a new font. So we describe the name of the font. Font family is uh, ethnocentric or font of all knowledge as he says. And then we define the source where to find the font. The source could be a local file that you have on your project file system. So for example, font of all knowledge dot wolf, which is one of the formats of, uh, of fonts. Or you can even probably use an external URL um, such as well, I, I don't know. If you add to card this one for the web, you can check out. Okay, this is getting too long. Yeah, I'm gonna buy these things for zero euros. I'm going to download these fonts and going to use them. Okay, that this is too too long, too long. Don't need to. Uh, apart from ethnocentric, I also used another font here, this one here, and this font is called Orbitron. And uh, the same goes with this Google fonts. I went to Google Fonts, I looked for Orbitron because I find it somewhere or I just uh, saw it somewhere. I want to select this style and this is some uh, HTML code that I can just put in my website. You see, it's a link tag, link rel preconnect, href font static and also link href this thing here. I don't even know exactly what all this thing means, but if I copy this and I put it in my HTML, then I've got my font available. And then in my CSS, I can specify that one piece of text can have a font family of Orbitron, or alternatively, if it could not find this font, it will just fall back 
to sans serif. This is how you import the font as a link tag, but you can also use an at rule, at import URL, and then again, font family, blah, blah, blah. Every font has a special way to be included. Just read the documentation, try, uh, with trial and error, you, you get it eventually. Um, I do it all the time. Uh, it's, not, it's nothing that you just learn once and use it everywhere. You just, every, every time you, you, you come up with new ways. So as you can see, the font face could be, yeah, specified as local. There's so many things that you can specify. And then you, you specify the font way, the font style, normal, etc., etc. One thing that I didn't see in the documentations that we saw so far is how do you make a text italic slanted? So you know font family is able to um, tweak the, the kind of font that you want to use. There's also font size, which tweaks the dimensions of this font. We saw font weight, which allows you to say if the font is bold or not, or thin, etc., etc. But we also have a property to make it italic. And if I remember correctly, it has nothing to do with font, it has something to do with text. In fact, we have no. <laughs> Don't remember, so how to make text italic on CSS. How to italicize text. You use the M tag, of course, but if you want to do it with CSS, you use, oh, it was font, font style italic. As you can see, you don't need to be a genius in order to do things. You just, you're just, you just need to be able to Google things. So font style italic. And now this particular paragraph is in italic. So as you can see, you don't need the I tag or the EM tag necessarily. You can do this with one CSS rule applied to your element, to your class, to your ID, to anything you want. Okay, so you can make anything italic. Um, there's also other text decorations that you can do. For example, text decoration is line through. And now the text seems completely can uh, cancelled. Uh, but there's also other uh, blink, which is not working, luckily, but usually blink makes blinking text, which is not a good show. You can have other kinds of text which are not working right now, uh, but we also have text that should be working, for example, overline or uh, underline. So you can underline, um, you can underline links or texts of any kind can have wavy but it doesn't work and speaking of text decoration underline if I have a link let's go back to a link is it in the index in index we've got a link I don't like underlines on link so what I can do is to say that all anchor links have a text decoration of none so a link has no underline but a hovered link instead of having a color of blue, we'll have a text decoration of underline. I like links better this way. So what is happening is that the link is just blue. And as soon as I hover on it, I have the, well, the confirmation that this is a clickable link. But by default, a link is not underlined, which makes it uh, more pleasant on the eye probably. Um, I, I don't like underlines on links. It's to HTML 1.0. Uh, I prefer to tell that this is a link by the color, not by the underline. And probably this is what I did on my own website, because these are all links. And as you can see, these are links that have no underline at all. But as soon as I hover on them, they have this glow effect, which is just a lighter color problem, probably, uh, which makes them kind of cool. Yeah, don't like that. Okay, so we even saw at rules. And then we can select not only just elements, but elements with specific attributes. And this works very well with form elements. 
For example, if we want to specify the width of 200 pixels on not all inputs, but only on those inputs that have a type of text, because there are many inputs, type radio, type checkbox, or type button, type select, type select? No, I don't think so. But if we want to target only those inputs who have a type of text, we can use attribute selectors. And it's like this, you say input, and then you open square brackets, and then type equals text. Some attributes, as you know, do not even need a value. For example, the attribute required on an input. We saw it when dealing with forms. And if you don't remember about them, I'll show them here. So this is a form that we created with some inputs, an input of type text. Well, this is by default. I didn't specify it's type text, but by default, if you don't specify type, it's text and it's required. So as you can see, this is an attribute that doesn't even need a value. It's just required. And this is another t input of type password, okay? So, in this case, this rule will be applied only to this input username, not to this one, because this is not an input of type text. And this other rule here is being applied to only inputs to, that are disabled, that have an attribute called disabled. Or if you put required, this applies only to inputs that ha are required, that have this attribute required. And we can also have special things like uh, this uh, caret equals, dollar equals, asterisk equal, which match not exactly the attribute value, but it, they are just a way to say, is this attribute beginning with something or is it ending with something or it, does, it, does the string contain something? Um, well, I don't know if you know the, the concept of contains, but... Uh, let's say blueberry, I don't know. This is a string of text and it contains the string burr, okay? So burr is contained in blueberry. Uh, blueberry also starts with the blue. So blueberry starts with blue and ends with rye. It, it must not be just uh, four letters or three letters. Blueberry ends with rye. So this is what these special um, characters mean. Uh, do you, you want to check if an input has an attribute or an element has an attribute which starts with begins with some uh, small word like is blueberry starting with bear or is blueberry ending with rye or is just blueberry containing this blue no wait a second blue was the start bear was inside okay you, you, you I, I thought it, I I hope you, you understood me, even though I messed it up. So, A with an href of caret equal HTTP means every link that has an href value, an href attribute, which starts with HTTP. So, this is what happens with all the external links, not internal links. All the external links that point to some other website. And this is apparently adding a background of arrow PNG on the right. So, these are advanced selectors that you will probably use one day if you work with HTML, CSS. Just put them in the back of your head and as soon as you need them, you will say, yeah, I, I happen to remember I saw something like this. Let me go back to Anthony's slides and I will see uh, what it, this is about. Or if it's not my slides, let's go back to Wait a second. Let's go back to the HTML dog website or W3Schools website and let's see again what these selectors were about. Okay. Then we've got transitions. Uh, I think that we are not able to finish CSS uh, today. So we'll have a beyond CSS uh, next lesson and then we'll start with, uh, with JavaScript. But still, uh, transitions. So, transitions are a cool way to start animating uh, elements inside of your website um, in a very easy and declarative way without even the need of JavaScript most of the times. So, for example, if you have a link with a color and when you hover on the link you want another color, you don't want this uh, 
change of color to be instant, but you want to make a transition between one color to the other. How do you do that? You add the transition property. You add something like this, transition all dot five seconds linear zero. What does this mean? We don't care because there's always an online tool that allows you to create transitions. CSS transition generator. So you've got this preview and when you hover on the preview, you see that it zooms, it becomes a little larger, right? So this is a transition that apparently is all 0 0.5 seconds, 0 seconds ease. The property all means that you are transitioning every CSS property that you specified in the rule. This is really not performant. If you want to, for example, uh, make a transition only on the property of width, you should specify that only the width will be transitioned. As you can see now, the transition is only applied to the width and not to the height, for example. Or if you want to transition on the height, you cannot in this thing because there's no such uh, option. Let me check with background. Okay, the background is the only thing that transitions. Uh, opacity, it disappears. Or you can do box shadow and you can see the box shadow appearing slowly instead of just appearing instantly. Uh, border radius, you can have the things becoming round with a smooth animation. Text shadow, nice. Or transform, this is some CSS transform that is probably slanting a little bit this object. And uh, we can keep it all for now. Then we've got a duration. So the transition will, will last 0 0.5 seconds. Do you want it to, to be longer? We can make this thing big in 5 seconds. Really slow. But then we got... Uh, let's go with 1 second to make it slow enough but not too much. Otherwise we'll... Okay, you see how it's like a pumping heart. Then we've got a delay. The delay is zero right now, but we can do a delay of three seconds, which means that as soon as we hover, it will start counting three seconds and then starting the, the transition, okay? So you can make the transition go a little uh, later on, which is something that I wouldn't suggest because it looks unresponsive for three seconds. And then we've got a function a transition function. So we saw before the transition of linear, which makes the transition being applied with a linear curve. So at every frame of second, the transition will do an uh, equal step. But you can use other functions which make things start fast and then stop slow, um, like easy in probably. Yeah, sort of. Uh, or is, is in out. Yeah, this starts fast and uh, stops slow. Is out. Starts fast and then woo, stops slow. Uh, is in is, should be exactly the, the opposite. So it starts slow and then goes faster. And then we've got is in out, which starts slow, goes fast and then ends slow. There's also this ease, which I don't know actually the difference, but it's cool. Or you can specify your own transition function through Bezier curves, which is a mathematical concept that you don't need to know. But if you really want to know, uh, I already told about Bezier curves during the presentation of this academy. So just for the curious, if you want to know what a Bezier curve is and how it behaves, not this one, probably I should have gone to this. This is a Bezier curve. This one here is a linear curve. But if you do this, it means that you're starting slow, then you're accelerating, and then you're ending slow. And this is a cubic Bezier of dot four four dot zero eight dot five five dot ninety six. Don't need to know anything about this. If you like the shape of it, you copy it and you paste it in your CSS code, and that's it. So you can specify whichever things you want. I, I think you can even go like this, and this will probably be like a bouncing ball because it goes 
if you try to go on the to the right for example and if you go below here it will probably start going to the left and then accelerating to the right and then go too far and then uh, fixing itself uh, where it's supposed to be so you can do any kind of crazy shapes and you will see the the effect on uh, on your transitions uh, there are some uh, ready-made transition for example linear or ease or is in, is out, is in, out, or you can specify your own Bezier curve if you really want to. Don't do that, not for now. And these are all the properties that you can apply to transition. So transition property, duration, timing function, and delay, which can be all set in the same line if you just use the shorthand property transition, which is what we saw uh, so far. There's so many other things that we can place on backgrounds. For example, recently you can start having multiple backgrounds. And uh, there's a cool example of multiple backgrounds here. Not this one. Not even this one. Where is that? Uh, multiple backgrounds CSS. Here it is. This is multiple backgrounds because we have one background which is tiled, this uh, grayish, we call it ochre in Italian, and we also have this image which is applied as a background here on the bottom right. So how do you apply multiple background? Here it is. Background image is a first URL and a second URL. So you can specify two background images just by separating them with a comma. And you can specify multiple other properties such as position and repeat by just separating them with a comma. So right bottom is the property of the flower, but left top is the property of the paper background. And the first background, the flower, will not be repeated because we want just one flower here on the bottom right, but the second background will be repeated, so it's tiled in here. So you can stack multiple backgrounds together. You can even put everything in one shorthand property like this, and this is what you achieve. Okay, Nothing really new from a syntactic point of view, just need to know that this exists and you can use it. It's free. And uh, what else? Okay, transitions are a pretty easy way to do animations, but what kind of animations can you do? You can uh, place things around, zoom them, or you can apply transformations. Transformations are something like rotating a thing, scaling a thing, skewing a thing, and translating it around. These are all things that you can do. So you can uh, just use the property transform, which allows you to, for example, rotate your element by 10 degrees to the left. Will this really work? Yes, it does. For example, Google is your friend. I can just apply a transform to this link, transform, and I will rotate this link 40 degrees. And it doesn't work because probably this link is a display in line or something like that. Let me see what happens if I say display in line block. Yep, now it works. So as you can see, transformations are not apparently applied to any kind of element, only to elements which have a specific kind of display. For example, display block or display inline block, but not display in line. And now you can see that the element was rotated. Bobby says, do you use linear and quadratic curves or is it just the cubic ones that are a function? I think that we just use cubic ones. I um, don't think that we can use quadratic curves. Quadratic curves CSS. There is a quadratic curve too, but it's only applied in canvases, which is something that I never explained and I'm not planning to explain. But you can open some sort of JavaScript portal in which you can uh, draw anything you wish, just like with a canvas. There's a, spe a specific HTML element called canvas in which you can type some JavaScript. In writing some JavaScript, you can create anything, even games. Uh, but this is not the case. No, we're just using cubic Bezier curves. And most of the times we're not even aware of the fact that we're using Bezier curves. We're just using ease 
transitions. So we can have multiple kinds of transformations and even combine them. We can rotate things, we can skew them, we can scale them by some factor, scale two, which means double the size. Let's try. Um, what happens if I say rotate and then scale by, yeah, 1.5. You see, it's rotated and then scaled. Here you need to know some basics of, uh, of fine transforms if you want to make things complicated. So don't, don't make things complicated. But sometimes there is a difference between scaling and then rotating or rotating and then scaling. But you don't need to know it right now. So don't worry about that. As soon as you need something, you will document yourself about that thing and that's it. And you can also translate things around. Uh, you can combine transformations just as we saw. We can define the origin from which you will start uh, rotating things or uh, scale things etc etc and I think that we can stop for now because it's already two o'clock my time but uh, we almost finished the CSS advanced which we'll cover next week along with the beyond CSS set of slides which is probably one of the most important uh, concept that I can tell you uh, because these are basic stuff but please 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 Try to study and practice on these basic stuff because otherwise you won't be able to understand when I'm talking about beyond CSS. Also, if uh, we go fast enough, next lesson we will finish CSS by talking with beyond C uh, about beyond CSS and we'll start right away doing some JavaScript, finally. So this will probably be... Uh, a change of perspective, a whole change of perspective. So thanks a lot, guys. As always, uh, I'm amazed by the fact that you're sticking with me on the eighth lesson without getting bored or probably you're bored, but still getting strong. So um, relax for now. Have a nice weekend and uh, see you on Wednesday if you want to chat with me and uh, play music or talk about music and other stuff or if you want to do some exercises together. In the meantime, remember to eat pasta, code pasta, and see you next week. Bye.